Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you very much. May we please call Mr. Miller? Of course. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Could you confirm your full name, please, Mr. Miller? David William Miller. Mr. Miller, you have already given evidence in phase two of the inquiry and attended the inquiry for that purpose in October 2022. Thank you for coming back to the inquiry to assist it in its work in phases five and six. As you know, I will be asking you questions on behalf of the inquiry. You should have a hard copy of the second witness statement provided by you to the inquiry in a bundle in front of you at the second tab. It is dated the 28th of February of this year. Do you have that? I do. If you could turn to page 16 of that, please. Do you have a copy with a visible signature? I do. Is that your signature? It is. I understand that you have a correction that you wish to make to this statement in light of recent disclosure. Would you like to tell us what that correction is? Yes, in paragraph 51, um, I make a statement about the impact program and disclosure this week has reminded me that I was in fact on that board. So I was on the impact board. With that correction made, are the contents of that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. For the purposes of the transcript, the reference for Mr. Miller's second statement is WITN 0347020. And for completeness, the reference for Mr. Miller's first statement provided for phase two, which already appears on the inquiry's website, is WITN 0347010. My questions today, Mr. Miller, will focus on the matters covered in your second statement relating to phases five and six, although I may refer back to your phase two evidence where it is relevant to those phases five and six issues. <coughs> Starting, please, with the roles you have held with the post office. You helped with this when you gave evidence in phase two, but given that it was some time ago, I hope you'll forgive me for going over this ground again in brief. You joined the post office in 1970, is that right? Correct. You moved to Post Office Counters Limited in 1983? Correct. In 1995, you joined the Horizon Project? Correct. And that was as a deputy director at that stage. And you were appointed Horizon Programme Director in 1998, is that right? Correct. In phase two, it was your evidence that you had delivered a nationwide project for the post office a few years before, but that you did not have a technical background, is that right? That is right. You say in your second statement at paragraph three, that you left the Horizon Programme Director role at the turn of the year 1999. Um, by that, do you mean 1999 into 2000? I do. Your oral evidence in phase two was that you left the role in early 2000, and it may be that a document we're going to look at later this morning will assist with the timings of that. You went from the Horizon Program Director role into the role of Managing Director of Post Office Network, is that right? That's correct. A position you held until July 2001. Correct. Your responsibilities in this role included you having responsibility for the Operations Directorate and the Automation Directorate, is that right? Uh, there were some others as well, but yes, those two certainly. 
Is it right that post office security and investigations operations fell under the operations directorate? Yes, at that stage for the, for the 18 months they did, yes. Is it right that the Horizon system, among other systems, fell under the Automation Directorate? That's correct. Who was it who reported to you on post office security and investigations operations when you were managing director of post office network? I think it was Alan Barry as operations director. But I'm not absolutely sure. Who was it who reported to you on any issues relating to the Horizon system when you were managing director of Post Office Network? Uh, David X. Smith, if I can put it like that. The IT David Smith. The IT David Smith. And did you report to Stuart Sweetman in this role? I did. Is it right that you did not sit on the board as Managing Director of Post Office Network? That's quite right. Although you held the role for 18 months, you say in your statement that you were on sick leave for the last six months of that time. That's true. And at paragraph 10 of your second statement, you say that you returned to work in August 2001. That's correct. And at this point, is that when you became operations director of the newly reconstituted Post Office Limited? That's correct. In this role, you initially reported to the managing director of Post Office Limited, is that right? Um, I think I reported to Stuart Sweetman. In the operations director role? Um, when it, yes. And then I think Stuart Sweetman left and Paul Rich took over temporarily as um, Managing Director of Post Office Limited before David Mills arrived. And David Mills arrived as Chief Executive in early 2002, is that That's right? That's correct. After which point you reported to him? I did. You say in your statement that when you were operations director, you were responsible for the retail line, including sub-postmaster relations and for cash, cash distribution. Is that right? That's correct. But you also had a role helping David Mills to understand the business and assisting in recruiting new directors as required. Yes. As operations director, you sat on the board, the Post Office Limited board, is that right? That's correct. So you were an executive member of the board from the point of taking up this role um, in 2001. Just to pin down the point at which you became a member of the board, you say in your second statement at paragraph eight uh, that you were a member of the board from November 2001. Um, there appears to be a gap between you taking up the operations director role in August 2001 and that point. Is that right? Um, yes, there is. A and why was that? Um, I'm not sure, but the, the, it may be to do with the precise setting off of the date of Post Office Limited when it was reconstituted. You say in your second statement at paragraph 11 that as the scope of the changes needed became apparent, David Mills changed your job title to Chief Operating Officer. Are you referring here to changes needed to the business, to Post Office Limited? You say in that paragraph that you thought this happened in about 2004. I'd just like to look at some board minutes, please, from 2002, which were sent to you for the purposes of preparing your second statement, which might assist with dating this change in role to the Chief Operating Officer. Could we have on screen, please, POL 2479.
These are the minutes of a meeting of the Post Office Limited Board on the 24th of May 2002. We can see David Mills in attendance as chief executive and then two people down we have your name and title operations director David Miller. So at this point it appears that your title was still operations director would you agree? Yes indeed. Could we have on screen, please, POL 3021480? These are the minutes of the Post Office Limited Board meeting, which took place later the same year, on the 26th of September 2002, Looking about halfway down the page, we see your name next to apologies. A little further down, please. David Miller and your role described as Chief Operating Officer. It appears from this that you held the role of Chief Operating Officer by September 2002 rather than 2004. Would yes, you I, would, I, the, I would go with the minutes, obviously. <clears throat> On the face of these minutes, there is no person listed as being operations director. Was someone else given the role of operations director when you became chief operating officer, or was the role subsumed by the chief operating officer? The role was subsumed. The board minutes the inquiry has seen suggest that by February 2005, Rick Francis had been appointed as operations director and was attending board meetings as well as you as chief operating officer. Can you help with the circumstances of Rick Francis's appointment and the remit of his role? Yes, um, Rick Francis was recruited uh, to run IT, so he was IT director, um, but as uh, David Mills reviewed responsibilities. He felt it would be beneficial if Rick took on some of my operations responsibilities, particularly cash. And therefore, my role was uh, changed a little bit in order to accommodate that. You say in your second witness statement at paragraph 11 that the chief operating officer role focused on some of the major changes needed to stay solvent. Is that for Post Office Limited to stay solvent? Yes, that's true. What was the financial position of Post Office Limited when you became chief operating officer? Um, we were running at a loss and um, we were trying to put ourselves in a position where we didn't run at a loss. The complicating factor was that um, to run the rural network needed a, a subsidy from government, and there was a lot of work on what size of the rural network ought to be and how much money we would therefore require from the government to run it. What was your brief from David Mills as to the priority to be given to improving the financial position of Post Office Limited? Uh, my first priority was to do uh, a project which was called Network Reinvention, which was in fact closing um, originally 3,000, I think in the end it was 2,500 of the non-rural post offices. Um, the, uh, the government had supplied a sum of money, 150 million, voted through Parliament to compensate sub-postmasters. And it was a question of working out uh, the pe where the people were who wanted to go, where we needed post offices, and try to make a best match of the two. You say that the chief operating officer role focused on 
these major changes in relation to staying solvent. Were you briefed by Mr Mills on any other priorities for you as Chief Operating Officer when you took up the role? Um, no, he, he focused very heavily on the need to get the company into a solvent position. So that was the overriding priority at that time? Yes, it was. You say in your statement that you reported to David Mills until he left the organisation in late 2005, is that right? That's correct. And when he left, you became temporary managing director of Post Office Limited for a two to three month period until Alan Cook arrived as David Mills' replacement. Yes, it was until Alan Cook arrived, whatever that period was. You then reported to Alan Cook until you retired on the 28th of July 2006, is that Correct. right? Presumably reporting to Alan Cook as Chief Op Operating Officer once again. Correct. Before we come on to the detail of your involvement in the issues being explored in the current phases of the inquiry, I'd like to address, please, the question of your understanding of your duties as an executive director on the board. When you were appointed as a board member, were you provided with any induction or training covering the nature of your duties as an executive member of the board? Uh, yes, uh, we, we did um, a, a day session with uh, our solicitors, Slaughter and May, but that focused very heavily on the issues regarding uh, company uh, profit and loss and on our duties as board members if we felt the company was not going to be able to pay its creditors in the future. What was your understanding of the board's accountability for the oversight of operational performance? Um, that we were responsible for that. What did you understand your accountabilities to the Chief Executive Officer to be when you were Operations Director and then Chief Operating Officer? Uh, I was responsible, responsible for the areas that I had been allocated for, um, I was responsible for whatever targets were agreed between me and the Chief Executive. Um, and I was responsible for, um, no, I think that's it, sorry. Would you agree that the identification, analysis and management of risk is central to running a company? I would. Do you agree that it is a vital area of board oversight and of fundamental importance? Yes. Do you agree that identifying, analysing and managing risk was a fundamental part of your executive responsibilities? Yes. Would you accept that in order to discharge your responsibilities in relation to risk, both as an executive and a board member, you needed to be proactive and curious about possible risk areas? Yes. Where you identified a risk when carrying out your executive role, what were the mechanisms in place for you to raise that risk, first with the CEO and second with the board? Um, I've had one-to-ones with the CEO and I would expect risks that I identified to be raised there. Um, but that we, the board had a risk register and um, there was a process by which actually anybody on, in, in the company, certainly board members, could put items on the risk register. These would then be assessed by finance um, and then they would appear on a regular basis on the risk register as a risk defined and what mitigation action was required. Do you consider that the culture at the post office was supportive 
of executives reporting concerns about risk to the CEO and the board? Yes. Why do you say that? Um, just that um, it wasn't just the CEO, it was Sir Mike, who the, the inquiry has seen, um, set up a risk committee, um, and, and he was keen that we should be looking across the areas and identifying risk, as well as David Mills. So it wasn't just at CEO level, it was at chairman level as well. Ms. Price, there's still a, a document on my screen. Can I come Apologies, down? Apologies, sir. That can come down. Thank you. Oh. When you were in directorship roles, was your remuneration fixed or performance-based? Um, largely fixed, uh, but there was a performance element in it. How was your performance measured? Uh, there would be uh, targets agreed um, at the beginning of a financial year and then those targets would be um, reviewed with the chief executive at one-to-ones throughout the year and at the end of the year conclusions would be made as to whether targets have been met or not. Targets for what? Uh, Costs of running the business, uh, some targets for uh, feedback from staff on what they felt about the business. Um, I'm sorry, it, time is um, not, not helping me here, but um, there, there are a number, is all I will say. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, things like quality of service in terms of uh, particularly at direct office counters was it was a, an issue that was fairly big did you receive bonus payments whilst you were in any of your director roles i did how was the level of bonus payment determined uh, that was done i think there was a remuneration committee but that seemed to be taken Decisions on that seem to be taken outside the, the main board. I'd like to turn, please, to uh, the knowledge of the Horizon system issues in the run-up to Legacy Horizon rollout, gained from your time as Horizon Programme Director, which you brought to your subsequent roles. I don't intend to go back over your phase two evidence in any detail, but I would like to draw together some key points, which I will take one at a time. If at any point you want to look at the transcript of your oral evidence, we can bring that up on the screen to assist you. Um, just say if you'd like me to do that. First, you told the chair you were aware of issues with the cash accounts in March 1999, arising from the end-to-end -end testing which had been done. In particular, there had been incorrect cash account mapping, which would have caused misbalancing cash accounts in all offices had the system been in operation. This resulted in an entry on a known problem register and your position in phase two was that this was an issue which was being dealt with. Is that a fair summary of your evidence on the March 1999 end-to-end -end testing report? That is. Second, after the live trial of the Horizon system in May 1999, you were made aware that sub-postmasters were having serious problems with the software especially the balance. And this was explained to you at an NFSP meeting attended by you on the 11th of June 1999, and at a meeting at around the same time, attended by a large number of sub-postmasters in the northeast. Again, is that a fair summary of your evidence on your awareness of issues being experienced by sub-postmasters yes. trialling the system? 
Third, you were asked about the minutes of a board meeting which had taken place in July 1999 and which you attended. The minutes recorded an assessment attributed to you that the Horizon system was robust and fit for purpose. You were asked about this by both counsel to the inquiry and by Mr Maloney on behalf of the clients he represents. Is it fair to summarise your evidence on this point in this way? You would not have told the board that the Horizon system was robust and fit for purpose because at that time it was not either of those things. That I would not have done it. Your evidence, and we can go to the, your responses to both counsel to the inquiry and to Mr Maloney, but your evidence was that it was not correct that Horizon was robust and fit for purpose. No, that, I remember that exchange with Mr Maloney. Yes. Um, and I, I should not have said that it was robust. What is your position then on whether you did say that? Um, I can't remember the board meeting, but I make the assumption that the board minutes are correct. So I did say it. Sorry, uh, Mr. Mill, I want to be clear about this. You don't actually remember what you said. You are prepared to assume that the board minutes are correct. And if they were correct, you should not have said what is recorded. Is that it? I'm afraid so, sir, yes. Right, thank you. Fourth, in August 1999, there were ongoing concerns about transactions being completely and accurately recorded in particular those raised by acceptance incident 376, which had not been resolved by the time you left the Horizon Programme Director role. Is that a fair summary on that point? Yes. There are just two documents I would like to go to from the final months before you left the Horizon Programme Director role, given their importance. Could we have on screen, please, POL 3090839? Going to the second page of that document, please. This is a letter to you dated the 23rd of August, 1999, from Ernst & Young. And scrolling down a little, please. You see here, dear Mr. Miller, Horizon acceptance testing. As auditors of the post office, we have been asked by Post Office Counters Limited to provide you with our views in respect of certain accounting integrity issues arising from tests performed by POCL on Horizon data in the live trial. We have not performed any validation of the issues or testing of the data. Our views expressed in this letter are based on information provided to us by Post Office Counters Limited resulting from their tests. This letter is not intended to provide any insurance over any data in the live trial or over any results arising from tests of such data. The live trial is limited to 323 outlets. And the next paragraph, the following issue, as described to us by Post Office Counter Counters Limited, gives us concern as to the ability of Post Office Counters Limited to produce statutory accounts to a suitable degree of integrity. We understand that Post Office Counters Limited has attributed a severi severity rating of high to this matter. There's then reference to incident 376, that's acceptance incident, incidents 376, and a reference to data integrity. And the last sentence there at present, this control test is showing discrepancies in that certain transactions do not record the full set of attributes and this results in the whole transaction being lost from the daily polling. 
We are also informed, the paragraph below, that an incident has also occurred where transactional data committed at the counter has been lost by the pathway system during the creation of the outlet cash account and has not therefore been passed to TIP in the weekly cash account subfiles. Both types of incident result in a lack of integrity on each of the two data streams used by Post Office Counters Limited to populate its central accounting systems. We understand that the cash account data stream is the primary feed for Post Office Counters Limited's, Post Office Counter Limited main ledgers and client reconciliation processes. Just going over the page, please. We see the second paragraph there. It is fundamental to any accounting system that it provides a complete and accurate record of all transactions. These discrepancies suggest that the ICL pathway system is currently not supporting this fundamental. On the first page of this letter, please, going back to that first page and scrolling up, there are some handwritten annotations from someone with the initials DWN. Is that you? That is. And you say this, please ensure that these issues are fully addressed during the remaining acceptance process. Keep me in touch. Um, and one and two, uh, two appears to be Keith Baines. And can you help with who the first recipient of your comments is? That's right. Uh, who, sorry, who is the first recipient there? Bruce you? McNiven, I'm sorry, and he was a deputy director of the programme. You accepted in phase two that this assessment by Ernst & Young and the potential implications for the company accounts was very serious indeed. Yes, can I, could I just say, though, that we, um, Stuart Sweetman and I, Stuart Sweetman was my boss, and on the board of post office at the time. He was the sponsor of the project. We discussed um, what our relationship ought to be with the auditors, when we ought to start informing auditors about what we were doing. And this was part of the process to get Ernst & Young, who are our auditors, on side and understanding what we were doing. So when they came to audit things, they would have had um, forewarning. One of the last documents that you were taken to by counsel to the inquiry during his question in, in, in phase two was a document termed the third supplemental agreement, a document which you said at the time you remembered. Could we have that on screen, please? The reference is FUJ 00118186. And the date of this document is the 19th of January 2000, which is after, I think you say, you left the Horizon Programme Director role. But if we go to the last page, please, that's page 36. We can see that the agreement was signed by you on behalf of Post Office Counters Limited, witnessed by Keith Baines. Can you help with what role you were in when you signed the document? Uh, yes, I was still Horizon Programme Director and I was running that concurrently with setting up um, a new business unit as the Managing Director of Post Office Network. How long were you running those two roles concurrently? Until David Smith was appointed as the automation director. That can come down, thank you. You accepted when giving your phase two evidence that this agreement acknowledged that it was not always possible to get to the root cause of an imbalance or to make the appropriate correction. Do you recall that? Uh, I don't, but I will accept it. 
Could we have on screen, please, uh, Mr. Miller's second statement again? The reference is WITN 03470200, and it's the second page of that, please. You deal at paragraph four here with your view of things at the point you left as Horizon Programme Director. And you say, at paragraph four, at this stage, my view of Horizon was that it was a new, very large and complex system, which was under constant review and improvement by Fujitsu. I never considered legacy Horizon perfect, but thought that any problems with the system were subject to control procedures leading to resolution. And then going, please, to paragraph seven, over the page, please. After stepping down as Horizon Programme Director, I did not brief anyone from the POL or RMG boards, investigation teams, legal teams, or any other person responsible for the conduct of prosecutions or civil proceedings, because one, I thought that any problems with the system were subject to control procedures leading to resolution, and two, I was unaware of the full extent of the horizon issues until I read the judgments I have referred to. And those are the judgments you referred to on the previous page of Hamilton and others in the post office. Can you help, please, with what you mean by control procedures leading to resolution? Um, that, that there was a process in place of reporting errors or problems that had um, helplines on both the post office side and particularly on Fujitsu and that they were processing uh, as time went on. As things arose, they would be put into the system, processed, resolved. So that was my view of what uh, was going to happen. So you're not saying here that when you left the programme, you thought there was a complete fix in the pipeline to eradicate cash account inaccuracies. You were saying that you understood that when these occurred going forwards, there would be procedures in place to resolve them. Is that right? Yes. What was the basis for this understanding? Well, the basis was understanding what helplines had been set up and what the procedures were. When you say at paragraph 20 of your second statement that you believed that issues were being addressed going forwards, is this another reference to your understanding there would be control procedures in place? It is, yes. That document can come down now, thank you. In phase two, the inquiry heard evidence from Tony Oppenheim, the finance and commercial director of ICL Pathway, to the effect that the third supplemental agreement and the subsequent operational processes acknowledged that there would be occasional mismatches given the scale of the system. His assumption was that the post office would look at these and certainly at the outset, give postmasters the benefit of the doubt. He said that ICSL, ICL pathway needed feedback when these things occurred in order to find errors in the system and to fix them. Were you aware that ICL pathway's understanding was that where mismatches arose, post office would look into these and certainly at the outset, give postmasters the benefit of the doubt? Um, no. Could we have on screen, please, FUJ three zeros nine eight zero four zero? This is a PowerPoint presentation produced by David Smith, that is IT. David Smith, 
It provides a history of Horizon and Horizon Online. The date on its face is September 2010, some years after you retired, so you would not have seen this at the time. There are two parts of it, however, that refer to your involvement in Horizon issues, so I'd like to take you to those. Starting, please, with page 21 of this document. This slide deals with Post Office Counters Limited's views on the agreement reached with ICL, ICL Pathway. And it reads, the leaders at POCL felt they had been shafted by a government pathway stitch up whilst the group board signed up to the deal, brackets Sunday afternoon in the CEO's kitchen. Next point, they did so with a gun pointed at their head, sign this or all other things you want you can forget. POCL felt stuffed by pathway with terms that were imposed. Dave Miller, the MD of Post Office Network, said at the time, I had the same feelings about Pathway as I would have for the man who had just shoved 15 inches of bayonet up my posterior. No statement could more adequately express the attitude of Post Office towards Pathway. Do you recall making the comment, which is in quote marks there? Absolutely not. Are you saying that you didn't make that comment? I didn't make that comment. Does the sense or feeling described in relation to the post office's feelings towards pathway accord with your recollection? Um, the, all the circumstances around the um, departure of the benefits agency and the deal that the government had to do felt it had to do, and the pressure that was put on the post office, were partly known to people at my level. Um, but I think we felt, as a company, that we needed to carry on with the project, and we needed to work with Pathway, at ICL Fujitsu. Um, and the sort of negativity about it, I think there was a certain amount of resentment, perhaps understandably, but I mean, those words, a lot of that is entirely unprofessional. What we were trying to do was to make the thing work, to get it rolled out, to get Horizon in for the whole company, including sub postmasters, ironically. Moving please to page 32 of this document. This slide covers the pilot and the rollout. Then over the page, please, we have this. In parallel, Dave Miller, PONMD, and Mike Stairs, who headed up Pathway at this time, resolved to improve the relationship. And there are a number of things listed there. Series of workshops with a facilitator to better build relationships between the parties the success of the rollout and the development of CSR Plus helped to create more trust between the parties. However, the relationship was still crusty. Post Office wanted its pound of flesh to make pathway hit SLAs, for which there was no business impact if they were missed, but which gave Poll the right to terminate if they were not met within a given time frame. Just looking at the content of this slide, does this reflect you having some continuing involvement in the Horizon programme when you were managing director of Post Office Network? Yes, in the sense that we, I wanted us to work with Pathway in a constructive way to get things done. Um, and so that, that would be true. Um, uh, but um, this, this document that I have been shown before, um, it had no official position with regard to anything that was done by Post Office Network. This was written by somebody in 2010. Um, so I'm, uh, 
there are some elements of truth in this document, but there's an awful lot of writing it up for uh, for, the, for the purpose of, if you like, the ego of the person who wrote the document. Could we have on screen, please, WITN 0597023? This is a document authored by Jeremy Folkes and is dated February 2000. Its title is BA slash Post Office Counters Limited and Horizon, a reflection on the past five years, lessons, issues and key points. Going to page two, please. The introduction explains the purpose of the document. During the last five years of the various incarnations of the BA, POCL and Horizon programmes, there has been a considerable turnover of staff within the POCL team, leading at times to a lack of continuity and certainly a loss of key knowledge and accumulated wisdom. This document in the next paragraph is intended to help mitigate the effect of the loss of a further batch of staff. It evolved from the concept of producing a general brain dump document in addition to more usual formal handover for work in progress and the like. This document has been produced for Dave Miller, the managing director of post office network unit, the business unit which owns Horizon on behalf of the post office. Do you recall receiving this document at the time it was produced for you? I recall asking him to do it. Section C of this document covers future risk areas. Going to page 21, please. Section C6 is titled, Some Technical Capability Still to be Proven. And the introduction to this section says this. This section outlines a number of technical areas which it would be wise to watch, although they're not the subject of any outstanding acceptance incidents. They should not be taken of predictions of things which are yet to go wrong, more as a list of possible areas of weakness which could trip us up in the future, especially as the number of offices increases as the planned rollout rate up to the target full population. There is an argument based on the same principles as used to justify albeit not to great effect, the need for assurance during development that states the need for ongoing assurance during the live operation of the service and associated system. We do not appear to have any contractual basis to seek such involvement. However, we may wish to negotiate with Pathway at the relevant time to seek some confidence that these issues are indeed under control. Then a number of issues are raised. At C2, there is the effect of slow replication. The last paragraph on this page reading as follows. However, as a result of the proper handling of slow replication, i.e. the effect should be benign, these delays, these scenarios can go unnoticed and therefore unfixed if there is some underlying problem for a period of time. Other issues flagged going over the page, please, were communication failures, integrity during failure conditions, scalability, performance over time, and system management. Can you help with what you did with this document and any steps which were taken based on the content of it? Um, I... Um as far as I'm aware, I would have given it to David Smith, who is Director of Automation. What I, I would have done, like to have done, would have been to organise a meeting in the company with Jeremy. Jeremy was about to leave, by the way, which is why I asked. And I thought he had all these years' experience and we ought to understand. Um, uh, Unfortunately, the changes that were taking place uh, meant that, as far as I'm aware, that meeting didn't happen. So this was, if you like, put into our company archive. Um, and 
I suspect that some of the good stuff that, that is in here was not picked up. Could we have on the screen, please, uh, Mr. Miller's second statement? Uh, paragraph five, please, which is page two. You say here, I did not have any involvement with oversight of such issues. This follows on from your discussion of issues with Legacy Horizon when you were Horizon Programme Director. You say, I did not have any involvement with oversight of such issues after I stepped down as Programme Director. Just thinking of the documents we've just been to, does this remain your evidence notwithstanding um, the work you asked Jeremy Folks to do um, and the slide contents that we looked at? Or do you consider that work different in character? Um, I, uh, the two things that you have just quoted to me, um, I would consider that were different in character. Um, I would have liked to have taken a lot more notice of what Jeremy said. Um, uh, and I had that, as, as it were, on hand early on. The, the, the other thing that you showed me, I have not become aware of until relatively recently. And that was done in 2010. So I've distinguished between the two. Um, Turning them, please. That can come down. Thank you. Turning them, please, to criminal investigations and prosecutions. When did you first become aware that the post office criminally investigated and prosecuted postmasters for criminal offences arising from alleged shortfalls in branch accounts? I became aware um, of what the post office did in terms of prosecutions in 1970 when I joined the company and we had a, a session with um, the security part of the company, the Post Office Investigation Division for management trainees and they made it very clear that that was something the, the company did. They were talking primarily then because I was in Royal Mail about Royal Mail but they did say that this applied to sub postmasters. After the rollout of Horizon, the branch accounts were generated by the Horizon system. That's right, isn't it? Yes. And apparent shortfalls were identified on the basis of a mismatch between, for example, what the Horizon printout said should be in the till and what was actually in the till. Yes. Would you agree with that? So does it follow that once you were involved in the Horizon rollout, you were aware that prosecutions were being pursued using data generated by the Horizon IT system? Um, I, I wish it had been as crystal clear to me as that. But um, I think I have to say that I would have been aware, yes. Who did you understand was carrying out investigations which led to those prosecutions? Uh, post office investigators. Who did you think was responsible for the decision of whether to prosecute? Um, some... some Sorry, some of this is uh, what I have learnt through my attention to this inquiry. But there was a, a mix between our lawyers and the Post Office Investigation Division in terms of who would decide about prosecutions. Did you know that at the time, that it was a mix between the lawyers and the investigation. Well, I think when I say a mix, I think this varied over time. From what I've heard, I think this varied over time. 
um, with some, sometimes the lawyers being in charge, sometimes the investigators being in charge, and I probably wasn't as aware of that position at the point in time you are talking about. What did you understand the role of Royal Mail Group's criminal law team to be in relation to prosecutions? They were, as far as I was concerned, they were the uh, criminal law team of the company. Uh, Post Office Limited did not have a law lawyers. It used group lawyers and they were the people who actually made the decisions, gave the advice, and so on. At the time, to what extent did you consider the position of the post office to be unusual, being simultaneously the alleged victim, the investigator, and the prosecutor? At the time, um, I accepted it as part of what the, the company did. Um, subsequently, uh, I can understand how that is a potential conflict. At the time that you were part of the executive team and a member of the board, did you recognize that there were risks inherent in that position? Not sufficiently. Do you accept now that these were foreseeable risks? Taking one example, that the interests of the business, in particular financial interests of the business, might even properly influence the conduct of investigations and prosecutions? I can see now, looking back, that that could well be the case. Why do you think it was you didn't see that at the time? I think, um, and you know, this is this is hard. I think, um, having come through a system where the investigation division and the legal division had always acted in uh, a, an autonomous way, I think it was very difficult to see through that at the time. Knowing what you did about the potential for incomplete or inaccurate transactions to be recorded by the Horizon system, setting aside the control procedures which you understood would be in place, there was a further particular risk, wasn't there, that unreliable data might be used in support of prosecutions. Would you accept that? I would accept now with what I know, yes. Did you recognise that at the time? I didn't. Do you think that is a risk that you should have recognised at the time? Uh, looking back from here, yes. Was this a risk that the board as a whole identified at any point before you retired? Not as far as I'm aware. You refer twice in your statement to your working relationship with Tony Marsh, who was the Post Office Limited Head of Security, at paragraph 14 and at paragraph 55. Could we have paragraph 14 of Mr Miller's second statement on screen, please? It is page 5. Looking, please, at the last sentence in paragraph 14. or well, the last two sentences. I have no memory of a poll RMG problem management team. I think that refers to the part above. Apologies. Poll RMG security worked to group, although they were described as embedded in poll. I met Tony Marsh regularly for approximately an hour, and he had access to me at any time. 
And then going, please, to page 13 of the statement to paragraph 55. You refer to a document there, and we'll come on to that. Tony Marsh worked for the group security director with a dotted line to me. He was designated head of security in poll. I met him regularly, and he had access to me at any time if I was available. I had a good working relationship with him, and I trusted him. The document you refer to here um, is, uh, are the minutes from the Post Office Limited Board meeting on the 20th of August, 2003, the regular meetings you had with Tony Marsh, the ones you refer to in those paragraphs we've just looked at, did these start when you took up the role of operations director in 2001, or was it later? I honestly can't remember. But there is some, there is still some confusion in my mind because uh. Tony Utting, who was uh, and this, he, he was familiar to this inquiry. Uh, he had a line of reporting in the finance function. So he worked, according to his testimony, through to uh, Rod Ismay, who worked to Peter Corbett. Um, in my, during the time when Tony and I worked together, he actually worked for the group security director with what was known as a dotted line to me. So um, it was a confused situation looking back on it. It was Tony Marsh's evidence to the inquiry that at least at one point he reported to you would you accept that that is correct? That de facto... I don't, I, I'm sorry, I do not recall that. Could we look, please? Except, sorry, if I may, just when I was um, managing director of Post Office Network, he was in a line working to somebody who worked to me. the August 2003 board minutes that you refer to at paragraph 55. And perhaps if we can have those up on screen. That's POL 3021483. Looking at page eight, please. Scrolling down, please. We see here an item delivering security standards in the agency branch network, strategic choices. And under this, Tony Marsh presented the security paper to the board on behalf of David Miller. Can you help us with why he was presenting the security paper to the board on your behalf if it wasn't that he was reporting up to the board through you? Um, I can't, I'm sorry. Ms. Price, am I oh. right in thinking that Mr. Miller was present himself? Uh, yes, sir. If we yeah. can go to the first page of that document. So does that jog your memory, uh, Mr. Miller? Um, you, I, for some reason, uh, Mr. Marsh is making a presentation on your behalf. I, it, it, it doesn't, I'm sorry. Thank you. Setting aside the strict reporting lines, the activities that were conducted under the remit of post office head of security would have fallen under operations, would they not? Yes. And those activities included criminal investigations and 
to the extent that uh, the security team had involvement in prosecutions, their involvement in prosecutions brought by the post office. Was so this can, I, can I just question that? Because um, Tony Utting's evidence, and he was head of investigations, was that, as I said, he worked uh, through the finance line. Well, it may be that we can't uh, bottom that out through your evidence, uh, and the chair has the evidence from Mr Utting and others who were involved uh, in prosecutions over the years. But, but taking a step back, the activities under Tony Marsh, which certainly included criminal <coughs> investigations, we've already agreed that those fell under operations. So was that why you had regular meetings with Tony Marsh? Because the activities conducted under him fell under operations and you the, were chief The broad, broad area of Tony, Tony's remit, which was pretty wide, including terrorism and so on, he would, yes, we would discuss on a regular basis. Can you help um, with, I, I think you weren't sure when your meetings with Tony Marsh started, but did they continue until your retirement, accepting... Yes, yes, they did. Accepting the period you were temporary managing director? Yes. And how regular were your meetings with Tony Marsh? I, I, either monthly or pre-monthly. And those meetings lasted around an hour? Yes. How soon after you started meeting with Tony Marsh did you first discuss post office criminal investigations and prosecutions? Can you recall? I can't recall. Do you remember discussing those activities with him? I don't remember discussing any detail of those with him. Did you discuss with him your knowledge of the history of Legacy Horizon, including the issues relating to inaccurate cash accounts, which were still being addressed when you left the programme director role? I don't recall doing that. You don't recall doing so, or, or you didn't? Can I you don't say? recall doing so. Do you consider that that would have been relevant information for Tony Marsh to have had, given his role in relation to investigations and prosecutions? On, on reflection, and I have reflected on this very hard, uh, when I finished being the Horizon Programme Director, um, I think it would have been very beneficial if I had notified both the lawyers and the ID that that Horizon was a new system coming in and that they should be very cautious in looking at evidence coming out of that system. I didn't do that and I regret not doing it. It was Tony Marsh's evidence to the inquiry in July of last year that no one ever suggested to him that there were system faults and that investigators like him had absorbed a very strong belief from the business that the Horizon system was robust. Where do you think he and his investigators gained this very strong belief from? I think there was... Um, it depends... On what time frame you're talking about. Um, if we cover just the time frame between you starting as operations director until your retirement. Yes. Um, I, I was unaware of ever putting out any messages that Horizon was infallible. Um, so I'm in, in the early days, I'm not clear where those messages were coming from.
notwithstanding the close working relationship you had with Tony Marsh, do you maintain, as you say at paragraph 15 of your statement, that you were not involved in the oversight of investigations or prosecutions? Um, I do, and I go back to, to uh, the evidence about Tony Atting and who, who he, where he worked for, and he was head of investigations. Um, when David Mills took up the role of chief executive officer in April 2002, and you were operations director, you had a role helping him to understand the business. Did you share with him any information about the history of Legacy Horizon? We discussed Horizon, how it had come about, um, particularly the impact that um, the programme had had, the departure of the Benefits Agency. So he, 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 he got the history in that sense. Did you raise with him any of the issues that had been relating to inaccurate cash accounts ahead of rollout? No, I don't think we discussed that level of detail. Did you raise with him any of the problems that sub-postmasters had been experiencing in the live trial that had been raised with you? Um, I can't remember. I don't think I, I don't think I did. You covered in your phase two evidence another acceptance incident relating to training. Did you raise any training issues that had arisen? Yes, we had discussed that, and I think he picked that up in talking to sub-postmasters when he was out in the field anyway, um, and probably took some action on that. Did you not consider at the time the history relating to inaccurate cash accounts to be relevant information for Mr Mills coming into the business? Not at the time. Do you recognise that to be important information he should have had now? Um, I think it would have helped. It's a question of uh, the, the weight that I put on that information. I would put greater weight on it now than perhaps I did then. And why is it that you would put greater weight on it now than you did then? Because of everything that we've learned over the past two or three years. Could we have on screen, please, POL 3021482? These are the minutes of a Post Office Limited board meeting which took place on the 19th of June 2003. Uh, you were present in your role as Chief Operating Officer. Going to page two, please. Under Chairman's Business, there is a heading B, Horizon, and the minutes record this. The chairman expressed a particular interest in furthering his understanding of the capabilities and limitations of the Horizon system. Meetings would be arranged with the appropriate managers to provide the chairman with a detailed overview. The person listed to action this was Alan Barry. What role was he holding at the time? He was the IT director. And this was a relatively new chair of the board, wasn't it, Sir Michael Hodgkinson? It was. And he was expressing an interest in the capabilities and limitations of the Horizon system. D 
did you offer any information on the history of the introduction of Legacy Horizon at this meeting? Not at this meeting, no. Did you attend the meetings which were due to be arranged by Alan Barry? No, I didn't. I wasn't invited. Did you feed into the agendas for those meetings or suggest that the chair be told about the history of Legacy Horizon? I don't recall doing that, no. Can you recall who was involved in those meetings? I can't, I'm sorry. It was under... A, Alan Barry was at the same level director as I was and he was dealing with that issue. Did you provide any other input on or information about the known problems in the history of Horizon's development to the board, either at this stage or before? Not that I'm aware of. Was it not relevant information for the chair and the board to know that there had been weaknesses and faults identified in the process of getting Horizon to roll out? Yes, that was known within the IT directorate. So I've reached the end of one topic. Might that be an appropriate moment for the morning break? Yes, of course. Yeah. So what time shall we um, recommence? Uh, 25 to, sir. Okay. Thank you.
Hello, sir. Can you see and hear us still? Yes, I can. Mr Miller, I'd like to turn, please, to reports you received when you held director roles of sub-postmasters experiencing problems with Horizon, including unexplained shortfalls and attributing shortfalls to the Horizon system. Starting, please, with POL 30s, 93084. This is a case summary prepared by a post office retail line manager about a sub postmaster in Ramsgate who was experiencing balancing problems. There was a shortage of almost £77,000 revealed following an audit on the 13th of June 2003. The sub postmaster had refused to accept responsibility for the loss and had complained that he had not been given the chance to interrogate the Horizon system to prove that the loss was caused by the system. If we could go to page six of this document, please. The penultimate paragraph on this page. So at paragraph seven, just above that paragraph, we can see um, some explanation by the retail line manager of a uh, process that had been adhered to. Um, and then underneath those points, Further to this, the paperwork has been reviewed by Rhea McQueen and then by Dave Miller, Chief Operating Officer Paul, following a flag case complaint from Mr Andrews' constituency MP, and all was found to be in order. Indeed, Mr Miller emailed a response to this effect to Mr Andrews on the 10th of July 2004, in which he stated, the agreed processes have been followed in this case and I can find no evidence to support your allegations of unfairness. Do you have any recollection of this case now? I have read and reread this since I got it last week. Mm. And um, I'm, I, I cannot recall this case. I'm, I'm sorry, genuinely, I can't recall. And I know I'm, you know, I'm referred to in here as being part of this. How regularly were you involved in responding to complaints, whether addressed directly to you or reaching you via an MP? Mm, not a lot, because there would be some sort of flag case office where people, where those would be dealt with. Um, I don't know why I was involved in this particularly. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I, I just don't know. Does it follow that you can't help with whether you had any concerns about the nature of this complaint at the time? Well, I, I have to say, having read it, I have serious concerns. Because I think somewhere in here, there's, um, there's the, um, the line perhaps I've seen too often, which is that uh, the sub-postmaster couldn't prove that the system was wrong. And I think that's featured here, and um, that, that's unfortunate. Do you think that you had concerns at the time? You, I know you can't remember this particular case, but if you'd seen it at the time, would you have had the same concerns you have now? Um, no. Why not? Uh, because um, the there was clearly bubbling up within the business that there were issues with regard to Horizon. The extent to which those were being properly surfaced was really quite small um, and um, 
I mean, if I, it says I have reviewed this, I have reviewed the thing, the particular thing that says uh, he couldn't prove that Horizon was wrong and accepted that. Um, and, you know, that is clearly an error. Before you go any further, um, the expression, a flag case complaint, in that paragraph that um, uh, Miss Price took you to, it, it, it may be my fault, but I don't think I recall that precise uh, phraseology previously. Can you explain what a... Yeah, normally, sir, it's a uh, from an MP or, or somebody, uh, but normally an MP, and there is a process for dealing with those. There would be a person whose responsibility it was within the business um, to deal with those, to deal with the process, to make sure the paperwork was done. It would get priority. So in other words, a, a complaint which is taken pretty seriously? Yes. Or should be? Yes. Right. Sorry, Ms. Price. Not at all, sir. Could we have on screen, please, NFSP 50298? This larger document contains a series of correspondence involving a sub postmaster at the Cran Larrick branch at the NFSP and you. The sub postmaster's letter appears on page eight of this document. Could we go to that, please? This letter, scrolling down a little, please. Scrolling back up again, please. This letter is dated the 24th of August, 2004, and it raises issues accessing online services on Horizon due to failure in the ISDN line. It also raises uh, some unhelpful responses which were received after contact with the Horizon Help Desk and the Network Business Support Centre. The issue was raised with David Mills by the NFSP and you responded on his behalf on the 15th of September 2004. That's on page four, please. And we can see here, thank you for your letter of 2nd of September addressed to David Mills. Overall, Horizon Systems availability is good. There are nevertheless issues which we have under active review, and I will update you on these as we make progress. Our online systems continue to perform within expected parameters, and these parameters have been set in line with industry standards. For example, the service availability that we have planned and deliver for banking and e-top-ups is in line with that provided by the banks and other retail outlets. Understandably, there is a perception that the problems are on the increase. This is because over time, the number of branches that have experienced a problem has, as you would expect, increased. And as the volume of online business has increased, the impact of failures has increased. I repeat that overall system availability is very high and within the parameters to which the system was built. When a system goes down in a branch, a process of investigation is initiated in order to identify where the problem has occurred. The problem could be with the equipment within the branch, within the telecommunications network, within Horizon, or within a number of back-end systems provided by banks, mobile phone operators, and our debit card service provider. Once the point of failure is identified, the appropriate supplier can investigate the problem and having diagnosed it, provide an appropriate fix. It is not possible when an incident occurs to give precise information about time to fix ahead of understanding where the problem lies. Of course, in some instances, the source of the problem is obvious and it's possible quite quickly to indicate time to fix, but in other instances, diagnosis can be protracted. 
just going back to the first paragraph, can you help with what the issues which were under active review were at this time? I think the issues, this is, as I recall, about the ISDN lines, mm. which were the basis of the network at that time. Um, and there was variable uh, performance. If people were at the outer reaches of the ISDN network, ISDN network or in a particular difficult location, uh, problems could occur and fixing those problems could take longer than it ought to. And sub-postmasters rightly got very fed up when they, they couldn't connect, they couldn't do online business, and there was a queue out the door of people who were customers who were very unhappy. So I think that would be my view of what primarily this was about. Certainly it was strongly represented by the NFSB at the time. You will recall from the document which Jeremy Folkes authored in February 2000, the section relating to unproven technology when it came to integrity during failure conditions. Did you recognise at the time any risk that there might be an impact of system failures on SPMs in terms of the integrity of accounts data when these issues were raised? I, I don't think that, that was front of my mind at all. Would you have expected a root cause analysis to have been done by Fujitsu in these circumstances? I think that would have been very helpful. As far as you're aware, was there any investigation, whether by the post office or Fujitsu, as to any impact on the integrity of the data, the accounts data? I, I'm not aware. Did the issues raised in this correspondence, or indeed in the report we've just looked at from the retail line manager, have any impact on your view of what data would need to be obtained from Fujitsu, from post offices, in internal IT teams, or anyone else to support actions against sub-postmasters? No. That can come down, thank you. Turning please to the civil proceedings brought by the post office against Julie Wollstonehome and the settlement of those proceedings. You deal with this at paragraphs 57 to 61 of your second statement. Is it right that this case first came to your attention when Ms. Wollstonehome was challenging her employment status in 2001? correct. But at that stage, you say you were not made aware that Ms. Wollstonehome was challenging the Horizon system. Is that right? Uh, that, is, that is right. Um, it just what she was doing was, was a, um, would be considered by me and others to be a threat to the whole... Um, if, if she was wanting to change the sub-postmaster's contract and challenge that, that would be a significant challenge to the business model. So that would have been, when I say that, I mean um, that it would have changed the economics of how we uh, ran the business if she had won her case. Could we have please page 14 of Mr. Miller's second statement on the screen? Paragraph 59. Page 14. You say, my first formal involvement with the case was that I was asked to sign off the compensation payment to Miss Wollstonehome in 2004 in the absence of Peter Corbett, who was on holiday. Rod Ismay's note to Donna Parker, my PA at the time, secured a slot in my diary for Tony Marsh. Rod Ismay's note 
to which you refer here, is it POL 00142503? Could we have that on screen, please? This is the email from Rod Ismay dated the 26th of July, 2004. What role did Rod Ismay hold at this time? Um, I think he was head of some part of accounting. He was a direct report to Peter Corbett. So he's one step below the board. And the Donna Parker here, that's your PA, is that That was right? my PA, yeah. yeah. She was my PA, I'm sorry. Presumably she would have forwarded on to you the email she received, along with any attachment. Is that right? Uh, yes, I think she would. We can see the email was also sent to Mandy Talbot, Tony Marsh and Carol King. Do you remember Mandy Talbot? Um, I am aware of Mandy Talbot from this inquiry, not previously. Does it follow that you did not have much contact with Mandy Talbot? I didn't, no. And Carol King? Sorry. Before we come on to the detail of this email, I'd like to look at one further document, please. Could we have on screen, please, POL 00158493? This is an email dated 19th of May 2004 from Keith Baines to David Mills, the Chief Executive Officer, copied to Claire Wardle, Carol King, and Ian O'Driscoll. Can you recall Claire Wardle or Ian O'Driscoll at all? I don't recall Claire Wardle. I recall Ian O'Driscoll's name, but I, that's about as far as it goes. The title of the email is Action from Your Visit to the IT Commercial Team Meeting. And the email reads as follows. David, you asked who in post office was instructing the lawyers in the case referred to in the following risk on the IT register. Damage to reputation of post office and potential future financial losses if PO loses court case relating to reliability of Horizon accounting data at Cleveland's branch office. The instructions have been provided by Carol King in transaction processing. The case was being handled by Jim Cruz in legal services. Jim has now left Royal Mail and the work is outsourced to Waitman's visit who handle such cases for us in the Northwest. The case is scheduled for the week commencing the 16th of August. We have offered settlement and paid money into court based on what the sub post mistress would have received for three months notice. Regards Keith. It would appear from this email that the case with Miss Wollstonehome had been recorded on the IT risk register. To the extent that you can assist, which risk register was this? A post office limited risk register or a Royal Mail Group risk register? I don't know. I would think, given the people involved here, it was a post office IT department risk register. Were you aware that the case was on the IT risk register when you became involved? No. Did you have access to the IT risk register? No. How was the board kept updated about what was on the IT risk register? The, uh, the IT risk register should have fed up upwards to the board um, risk register as felt appropriate by the IT director. To your knowledge, did that happen? I don't know, I'm sorry. I certainly had not seen this posed in this way as a risk. This email predates the email from Rod Ismay to your PA. 
Do you recall David Mills discussing this case with you once he had noticed it was on the IT risk register? I don't. But it would appear that this was a case of which the Post Office Limited Chief Executive was aware. It does appear to be, yes. This was quite significant, was it not? The, the entry onto the risk register of a case which had the potential to damage the reputation of the post office because it related to the reliability of Horizon accounting data at the branch. Yes. This is something that the board should have been made aware of, wasn't it? Yes. It appears that the instructions were being given to the lawyers on behalf of the post, of the post office by Carol King in transaction processing. Um, you don't recall Karen, Car Carol King, but does that fit with your understanding of who would give instructions in a debt recovery case, in essence? I think that's probably right, but I can't say definitively. Going back, please, to Rod Ismay's email, POL 0014503. The email to your PA reads as follows. Donna, as discussed, here is the correspondence through the legal case. The first arrow below contains a note from Group Legal Today, brackets Mandy Talbot is acting on this case. This is council's opinion. The other arrow sections below contain some more background from Carol King in Chesterfield Debt Recovery Team. In summary, we suspended Mrs. Wollstone home in 2001 after apparent discrepancies in her cash accounts. We claimed for the value of these losses and she counterclaimed for loss of earnings. Within her claim was an expert's opinion, which was unfavorable concerning Horizon and Fujitsu. We have lodged £25,000 in court, but Mrs W has no legal representation and is pursuing the full amount of her claim, 188k. It goes to court next month. Mandy, Peter Corbett is on holiday now. I'm therefore escalating this to Dave Miller. Presumably he was doing that by sending this email to your PA, is that right? Can I just make a point? Yes. Um, Peter Corbett and I are on the same level. We were both directors of Post Office Limited. Um, so in my mind, escalation would have been to the level above, but it wasn't. Um, and at the time, I should have asked that question. So you think it should have been escalated to the level above? Well, as far as I'm concerned, yes. Why didn't you escalate it to the layer above? Um, because uh, I was dealing with it at speed and um, I signed it off. In this email, the, the part to Mandy then goes on, do you have a copy of the IT expert's opinion? Then there's a question for Tony Marsh. Tony, please, can you advise who in your team is leading in this case? Carol, thanks for your correspondence this afternoon. And then at the bottom, all, please do not circulate this any further than is necessary to support Dave and Group Legal with this case. Would you have read this email when you received it? Uh, no, because it would have gone to Donna. But I have subsequently read it and, and noted that bottom line. I asked earlier whether Donna would have forwarded the email and any attachment to you when she received it, and you thought that that was probably right. I did. If she did forward it to you, would you have read it? Uh, yes. The summary given 
in the top of the email was that the case arose out of apparent cash account discrepancies and that within her claim was an expert's opinion which was unfavourable concerning Horizon and Fujitsu. And your attention was being directed through your PA to two things. First, counsel's opinion on the case, which was attached, we can see, to the email. And second, the background to the case from Carol King in the email chain below. Starting, please, with the background to the case. This, in fact, appears to have been sent by Jim Cruz. If we can scroll down to page three in his email dated the 17th of March, 2004. The background is quite lengthy, but it contains this in relation to the expert's report. Going over the page, please, to page four, the third paragraph on this page. Paul then agreed to offer her up to £5,000 to settle. This sum was paid into court in July 2003, but has not been accepted. Since then, the report of the computer expert, Best Practice PLC, based on the available call logs, has been received, and as you are aware, is unfavourable and unflattering to Fujitsu, Fujitsu, if not actually hostile. In light of the report, which cannot really be challenged, I do not think that Paul will be able to prove, even on the balance of probabilities, that the losses were the fault of the SPM and our agents are still concerned about the lack of evidence for the losses. They want to obtain counsel's opinion on liability in quantum and the question of mediation has now been raised at the recent CMC. The next paragraph says this, at, at court, Mrs. W said that she would settle for two and a half times her annual remuneration, a total figure in the region of 187,500, as this is the figure being paid to sub-postmasters when offices are closed. Poll clearly cannot settle on the basis of such a sum, but the question of further set questions to the expert has been raised, and I can only see further costs being run up in this case, with very little chance of Poll getting its money, even if it proves the case. I intend, therefore, to advise that Paul should pay Mrs. W or pay into a court the figure of three months remuneration plus interest on the basis of, that although it is unlikely that Paul can now prove the losses were her fault alone, as per the contract for services, Paul can give three months notice without giving reasons, and this is all she will be able to obtain by way of damages in any event if she takes the matter to trial. The payment in should be, should be of another £20,000 to take account of interest since November 2000. If it is not accepted, the case will have to be fought to resist the counterclaim, which cannot be accepted, but costs should be cut by accepting the expert's report and not seeking to challenge it further, and effectively not pursuing the losses and paying her full remuneration for the three-month notice period on the basis that this issue all she will obtain by way of damages after a full trial. This was part of the email train chain to which you were referred in the top email via your PA. Would you have read this at the time? I, 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 I can't remember, but um, uh, I, I can't, sorry. I cannot remember. Okay. Do you remember having concerns at the time that there was a computer expert report which was unfavorable and unflattering to Fujitsu? I, um, there was conflicting information about this report. Um, and um, I, I have read it thoroughly in the papers that, that you have given me. And, um, the descriptions from various angles that were given to me of it seem to me to be unfair. In what way do you consider that, that? That Mr. Coyne actually did, within the information available to him, a, a good job, and um, that didn't suit various parties, including Fujitsu. And I think the inquiry has heard about that from Mr. Jan Holmes previously. Um, but certainly, uh, it wasn't given sufficient weight. 
Going back to the last line of Rod Ismay's email, and there's no need to, to turn it up, but Rod Ismay was asking recipients not to circulate this any further than necessary to support you and Group Legal with the case. Can you help with why he would have asked recipients not to do that? No. Coming then to Council's advice, could we have paragraph 60 of Mr. Miller's second statement up on screen, please? That is page 14. In the first sentence of this, you say, as far as I recall, I was not given a copy of the expert report or council's advice, nor did I request it. I definitely did not read it at the relevant time. We've seen from the email we've just looked at that council's advice was attached to the email sent to your PA. Does it remain your position that you didn't open it and read it at the time? It does, I'm afraid, yes. Why would you not have read it, given the summary of the case given to you and the background set out in the email chain? Because uh, the way this was channeled through to me um, was such that it came from a very senior finance officer and the head of security. And um, I... Uh, I, I mean, I, drew, I have drawn this case to your attention because I should have said, stop, let's review this properly and let's understand what this actually says. But I didn't. And um, it, I signed off the sum of money um, and um, it was paid. We, we, owe, we had agreed to pay this lady and we then paid her. Um, that was kind of my view. Um, but there, there were other views in this, as we can see from the paperwork, that people wanted to keep it quiet. Looking, please, to Council's advice. If we can have that on screen, please. It's POL 00118229. Going first, please, to page 18, towards the bottom of the page. We can see this is dated towards the bottom, please, the 26th of July, 2004, and it's been provided by a barrister from 9 St. John Street. Going straight to the key paragraphs, starting, please, with paragraph 10 on page 3. Council says this, Mrs. Wollstoneholm has defended the proceedings, claiming that the computer system installed by the post office was defective, and this was in fact the cause of the losses recorded within her accounts. Further, Mrs. Wollstoneholm puts the post office to strict proof of the losses it claims. Finally, Mrs. Wollstoneholm counterclaims for damages in respect of wrongful termination of her contract, breach of her human rights, claim under the commercial agent's direct regulations, a claim for breach of the implied term to provide a computer system fit for purpose. And at 11, the trial of this matter is now about one month away. A joint computer experts report has been obtained. This report concludes from the limited records available that the computer system installed by the post office did appear defective. There is a very limited amount of documentation available in respect of the detail of calls made by Mrs. Wollstoneholm and problems with her computer at the relevant time, as well as in relation to the errors and losses which built up in her post office records. This is because these records were destroyed after, uh, about 18 months after the events occurred. Going down, please. Recognising the weakness of its position, the post office has made a payment into court of £25,000. And at 13, I am asked to advise in relation to quantum and evidence. I am asked to take into a particular account 
that the post office is anxious for the negative computer experts report to be given as little publicity <coughs> as possible. Pausing there, can you help at all with where the message that the post office was anxious for the negative computer experts report to be given as little publicity as possible came from? No, I can't. Well, sorry, just to say it didn't come from me. Does this reflect a sensitivity, even at this relatively early stage in 2004, about the integrity of the horizon system? And particularly any publicity being given to that, yes. Going then to paragraph 17, page 5, please. In view of the negative experts' report in this case regarding the computer system in place, Mrs. Wollstoneholm's suggestion that the errors that arose were the result of defects in the computer system must be taken seriously. It is sufficient to place genuine and significant doubt on the evidence relied upon by the post office. In my opinion, to dispel that doubt and to persuade a court that its claim was justified, the post office would need to be able to produce to the court sufficient original evidence in support of its claim. It is unable to do so. I therefore conclude that the post office's claim against Mrs. Wollstoneholm in respect of losses on her account would be likely to fail. This opinion is extremely significant, isn't it? That because of the negative experts report, Mrs. Wollstoneholm's suggestion that the errors that arose were as the result of defects in the computer system must be taken seriously. Yes. Had you read this at the time, what would you have done? Well, I'd have had to um, say, hang on a minute, can we just understand exactly what is going on here? So I'd have had to have a meeting of senior people to review everything that was down here. Um, there was a lot of um, knocking of the, of the computer expert's opinion at the time by both Fujitsu and Post Office. And subsequently I've read what Justice Fraser had to say about it, and that was entirely wrong. Justice Fraser said he was right. And if you read the report, which I've done now, it's believable. Could we have back on screen, please, paragraph 59 of Mr. Miller's second statement? That's page 14. Starting at the second sentence, you refer to the email securing a slot in your diary for Tony Marsh. Can you recall how long after Roddy's Ismay's email, you met with Tony Marsh to discuss this. I can't, but I can't. I remember that I learned about it on the day. You learned about it on the day of the email, you mean? No, on the day that Tony came to see me. I see. So, you're, how did you become aware? Donna said, Tony Marsh needs to see you urgently. Or words to that effect, I'm sorry, I, I can't remember. But I do remember, the whole thing I, I remember about this is that um, it kind of just happened. It wasn't a, there's a process here to review something. It was, need to get this done. And um, Tony Marsh wants to get into your diary. It won't be for long. Um, and I have to say, I went along with that. Did you read anything before you met Tony Marsh? I, I, I can't remember what I, what I read. I'm sorry, I can't. You say, we met for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. To the best of my memory, he told me there was an issue with the expert advice. 
which had led our counsel to say that the case was unlikely to succeed. It was clear that he did not think much of the expert. The view was that we should cut our losses and pay up. He said something about Horizon. I cannot recall specifically what he said, but I remember checking with him whether there were issues with Horizon. I said something like, you are not saying there are issues with, with Horizon, are you, Tony? He said that there were no issues, and I got the impression it was a one-off case. During the meeting, he produced some paperwork to authorise payment, which I signed. So your recollection is that you signed off the authorisation of settlement at the meeting, is that right? Yes, it is. And you did so without having read counsel's advice or requesting the expert's opinion? I did. Why didn't you ask to see the expert advice when Tony Marsh discussed it with you in the meeting? Um, this, this came to me, as I say, as a on the day issue. Uh, it came from a very senior finance person and from the head of security who I trusted. And um, I regret, obviously, very much not having said, stop, let's review what's actually going on here. But I didn't. It may be that you can't assist at this remove, but what exactly did Tony say about the issues with Horizon or lack thereof? I, I, I can't. I mean, the, for this distance, I can remember quite a lot about this because clearly I must have been uneasy but um, I can't remember the detailed, the really detailed conversation. In fact, this was so quickly done that I doubt if there was a lot of detailed discussion. You do say, um, Mr. Miller, um, that you asked him, in effect, a direct question, whether there were issues with Horizon. And then you um, say what you might have said uh, in the brackets that follow. And you appear to be saying that he confirmed to you that there were no issues with Horizon. Yeah? So I, I'm a little bit mystified how that could sit with uh, the terms of the email which Mr. Ismay had sent. Because the whole case was about whether there was an issue with Horizon. Yeah, I'm sorry, sir. I'm not going to be able to help you. Well, one interpretation, and I'm simply putting forward possibilities, not expressing conclusions. One interpretation is that knowing that... Um, you hadn't read the relevant documents yourselves. In effect, Mr. Marsh misled you. Does that sit with your understanding of Mr. Marsh? I, I the way I, I'm looking back now and seeing how this was done does not sit with my opinion or previous opinion of Mr. Marsh which is that I trusted him implicitly. The other uh, alternative, which perhaps does sit with what you're trying to articulate, is that despite um, Mr. Coyne being a jointly uh, instructed expert approved by the court, um, 
there were those in Fujitsu and the post office who just weren't prepared to accept his opinion and therefore decided that what they do was to get rid of this case uh, for as cheaply as they could and then pretend it had never happened. Is that more likely? I think um, there was clearly a desire within the business to get this, to get rid of this case. Yeah. Whereas in fact, if responsible people within the business had um, treated Mr. Coyne's opinion uh, seriously and carried out some investigations of their own, it might have prevented many of the things which followed. Is that fair? I'm afraid that is correct, sir. Yeah, all right. Just following on from the Chair's question then, at paragraph 61 of your second statement, you acknowledge that by not reading Council's advice and the expert opinion, there was a missed opportunity. I do. Can you recall at all the level of settlement which you approved? Uh, I couldn't, but um, I think it was about 180 odd thousand pounds. But do you have an independent recollection of that now? No. Okay. We've seen reference to a number of figures in the paperwork, so that's why I asked just to be clear. Can you recall at all? I, I, if if I was, I'd been asked, I would have said it was under 150. But um, you know, I'm I've now seen quite a few numbers. Did you draw this case to the attention of the Post Office Limited Board at any point? No. Could I just Apologies, say why? Go on. Of course. Because um, this was in Peter Corbett's line of command, and the only reason he wasn't hadn't been dealing with it was that he was on holiday. And I would have expected Peter to discuss this at board level. Even based on the limited information that you say you had access to at the time, do you think you should have referred it to the attention of the board, notwithstanding Peter Corbett's area of responsibility? Um, I probably should. But uh, before that, I should have put a stop to it at the by saying... You know, this is this has got to be reviewed properly. Could we have on screen, please, POL three zeros nine five five zero six? This is a Post Office Limited Board status report relating to actions from the Post Office Limited Board meeting on the 13th of October 2004. Looking please to page four, there is an action for you, 21 civil orders, just before we look at the detail of that, what was the purpose of these board status reports? To keep, to keep people up to date with where we were 
and to remind people that they had actions and that needed to be fulfilled by the next board or whenever, sorry. And looking at the action under civil orders, the action is where fraud has been perpetrated against the company, ensure that the appropriate civil orders were being used immediately in advance of any criminal proceedings. And the status is recorded on the right-hand side of the page. I have received a report about the way we apply civil orders as of now, and I'm concerned that we're not properly exploiting the 2002 Proceeds of Crime Act. I have asked, therefore, for a speedy update of our procedures to do just that. It appears from this document and the board meeting minutes to which this action relates that you were leading on this item. Is that right? Certainly I was asked by the board to see what was happening in this area. Was this your, um, were these your words, I have received a report? Is this an entry by you? I, I, I can't remember, but it's there, isn't it? Can you recall at all what the basis for the conclusion that Post Office Limited should be properly exploiting the 2002 Act? I'm afraid I can't. Could we have on screen, please, POL 30s 21486? These are the December 2004 poll board meeting minutes. You are present in the list and going to page two please. We can see the issue of civil orders here. Action David Miller under F. And the minutes say this, in the event of fraud against the company, David Miller would ensure that the pensions of fraudsters were targeted to help ensure the company was reimbursed. Was this a proposal that you made to the board? This, this particular reference to, the pension, to targeting the pensions of fraudsters, or was this something that was proposed by someone else? It was something that was proposed by some, somebody else. I mean, I don't recall this in any detail at all, but I, um, I certainly didn't propose that. What, what was your view on that? Um, well, seeing it here, it sounds horrendous. Sorry, it sounds um, severe in terms of its intention. At the time, did you associate fraud and the commission of it with shortfall cases involving sub-postmasters? I don't know. Sorry. This was less than six months after you signed off on the Wolston Home Settlement, and you had earlier in that year, or in the course of 2004, been made aware of other sub-postmasters raising issues about the Horizon system. Did it occur to you at any time that this might be relevant to decisions about recovery in fraud, in fraud cases? I didn't make the direct connection, no. Could we have on screen, please, paragraph 16 of Mr. Miller's second statement? That's page five. You say here, I was aware that uh, Post Office Limited would, from time to time, pursue postmasters for the recovery of alleged shortfalls 
branch accounts, including through civil proceedings, but again, I did not know any of the detail and was not involved in the oversight of such action. Does the knowledge of your involvement in the actions relating to civil orders in fraud cases at board level change your evidence in all in terms of your involvement? Of well, I don't think oversight? I could be so absolute in saying I did not know any of the detail. Could we have on screen, please, POL 0010 07426? <coughs> and page three of this document, please. This is an email from Mandy Talbot to a number of recipients, including David X. Smith, that is IT Director David Smith. It is dated the 23rd of November 2005. It relates to a civil claim which had been brought by the post office against Lee Castleton for £27,000, which had led to a counterclaim limited to £250,000, given the summary in this email. First of all, were you aware of the Castleton case? at the time that you were in director roles? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having to think because clearly I've read an all, and seen an awful lot about it. I'm not, I'm, I, I do not recall it in any detail at the time. I may have heard the name, but the details of the case I don't think I was involved in. The first paragraph of the email reads as follows. Proceedings have been issued against Lee Castleton, the former postmaster at Marine Drive, for 27,000. It was known by the business prior to issue that Lee Castleton blamed Horizon for the losses. External solicitors were asked to check with the Fujitsu liaison team and to assure themselves that the evidence in respect for Horizon was sound before the issue of proceedings. There had been no security investigation, so the data had not been requested from Fujitsu. Then two paragraphs down. As part of the claim, the solicitors for Lee Castleton have stated in the allocation questionnaire that they intend to call evidence from other existing and former sub, uh, postmasters about the problems with the Horizon system. They have also asked for disclosure of data about all calls or complaints logged from postmasters about the Horizon system, presumably from the inception of the system. They have called for disclosure of all documents removed from the branch office during the investigation. There is an issue over locating all, of the, all these documents. This email also covers Mr. Bajaj's case towards the bottom of the page and it explains that he was of Torquay branch office, postmaster who is challenging the validity of data supplied by the Horizon system on which errors have been raised against his branch office. He has not been able to explain the losses and has been required to make good the losses by way of deduction from remuneration. No proceedings have been issued but the matter is in the hands of external solicitors. He has taken the step of writing an article in the Sub Postmaster November 2005 edition seeking, over another page, that's blank, please, information from other postmasters in a similar situation. His solicitors say that they have been contacted by other postmasters and that a class action is possible unless the deductions from remuneration are refunded. They also make a reference to what we assume is the Castleton case. Under that, there are some issues which are set out. In, issue, in each case, the postmasters are challenging the validity of data provided by the Horizon system. If the challenge is not met, the ability of Poll to rely on Horizon for data will be compromised and the future prosperity of the network compromised. Fujitsu's reputation will be affected. And there are a number of suggestions set out beneath that, which I don't intend to take you to in detail. You were not a recipient of this email, but David Smith was. 
this email and the suggestions underneath appear to have led to a meeting about Horizon Integrity in December 2005. Could we have on screen, please, POL 00119895? These are the minutes from that meeting which took place on the 6th of December 2005. We can see Keith Baines was present along with Mandy Talbot and Graham Ward, among others. And the first point under findings is this. There is no generally understood process for identifying emerging case cases in which the integrity of accounting information produced by Horizon may become an issue. Then under recommendations, page three, please. Recommendation number one is that a coordination role should be established to maintain a list of all current civil cases and potential civil cases where accuracy of horizon accounting information may be an issue and ensure that all relevant business functions are made aware of these cases. Under specific action points, that's page five, please. This is the sixth of those specific actions. KB, Keith Baines, to brief Dave Smith on the meeting's recommendations. Were you aware of this meeting to discuss in Horizon Integrity in December 2005? No. Did anyone report the findings and recommendations to the board, as far as you are aware? Not as far as I was aware. Did David Smith, that is IT Director David Smith, ever raise this with you? No, but at this time David Smith was not IT Director. He was in the IT department working to um, Rick Francis. Did Rick Francis ever raise no. This meeting or, or what was discussed at it with you? No. I had, in my department, there was one representative, which was John Legg, who worked for Mike Granville, who worked for me, and nothing came up that line about this. Going, please, to January 2006 and your involvement in the development of Horizon Online. You address this, that can come down now, thank you. You address this at paragraph 64 of your second statement. Could we have that on screen, please? It's page 15. You discuss in this paragraph um, some discussions that you were involved in, um, although that first document you say was sent when you were on sick leave. Um, and then you go on at the bottom. If that of was, sorry, just of if course. I can make a point about the dates. That was March 2001, and there was an understanding that the Horizon system would stop in 2005 and we had to do some serious thinking and planning about what we were going to do beyond that. Um, so I had discussed that with David Smith and others. I was on sick leave at the time that went in, but I would have been aware of what was in that document. You, at the bottom of that page, say, my involvement in the development of Horizon Online was in 2006, when acting MD for a couple of months in between David Mills and Alan Cook. I also signed off the document and the references there, which was prepared for me by Rick Francis, the IT director and his team who were developing Horizon Online. Could we have the document you signed off on screen, please? It is RMG 
Going to the bottom of page two, please. <coughs> we can see your name and January 2006 is the date. Going back to page one, please. Under background, there is this. It is essential that Post Office Limited achieves significant reductions in IT costs if it is to return the business to sustainable profitability. The major opportunity to do this resides with the Horizon system that is provided by Fujitsu Services under a contract that runs through to March 2010. Fujitsu Services proposed a major investment in application, branch and data center hardware which would simplify the solution, enabling significant reductions in recurring operating costs on the basis that the term of the existing contract was extended to March 2015. However, this proposition gave a gentle upward increase in operating costs once the benefits of the upfront investment had been realized. Post Office Limited concluded that if it was to achieve a contract that delivered year-on-year -year cost reductions, then it would need to contract on a radically different basis. Post Office Limited has negotiated the basis of a deal with Fujitsu that closely mirrors what it believes would be achievable by going to open market. Then under options on page two, please. There are a number of options which include do nothing and wait to complete the contract at the end of the current term. None of these options generate the savings required within the necessary timescale. Termination of the existing contract at a cost of circa 80 million pounds would enable disaggregation of the services in order to procure from best of breed. Can you help with what is meant by best of breed? Um, just best available to the market. I.e. alternatives to Fujitsu yes. potentially. Okay. This might deliver lower steady state costs. However, this would be at considerably increased risk and take longer to deliver. Then we have the Gartner Group have benchmarked proposals from Fujitsu, which has enabled Post Office Limited to form a view of what it might expect to achieve by going to the market. Post Office Limited firmly believe that the speculative additional savings that might be achieved through open competition do not justify the increased risk. Then under risk, there's acknowledgement here that there are risks around time, cost and quality with any IT, major IT investment. Post Office Limited and Fujitsu Services have, have now delivered 10 major releases of software to time, cost and quality. Cost reduction will require investment and doing this through the existing relationship presents the least risk route. Additionally, a series of caps and collars are in place that limits Post Office Limited's exposure to cost over runs. The risk that post office would achieve greater savings through open competition is mitigated through post office limited right to market test unbundled components of the contract. This market testing could enable the post office to complete all of the existing contracts over a period of time. And the recommendation at the board, apologies, the current position, all the major principal areas necessary for a deal have been agreed with Fujitsu and these have been endorsed at chief executive level. Detailed terms will be in place by March. The intention was to go to the February Post Office Limited Board and the March Royal Mail Holdings Board to seek formal approval for a new contract and associated investments. The recommendation is for the board to note the progress. At the time that you signed off this paper, were you aware of any review or audit conducted by the Post Office or any independent contractor of the effectiveness and reliability of Legacy Horizon? No. This was relevant, wasn't it, to whether further investment in the Fujitsu platform would be a good business decision for the post office? Um, yes, except that the aim, I think, of this was to move on beyond legacy, seeking improvements on many fronts.
there is a focus in this paper on the saving costs in Horizon. How were you satisfied that Fujitsu could be made to produce the same or similar service more cheaply? I, I, I wasn't at that stage. I mean, I think work had been done by Rick Francis particularly, and there are comparisons with by a company called Gartner who compare who compare IT systems systematically. Um, so a lot of work had been done in that area. Given the reports to you of problems experienced by sub-postmasters with Horizon that we've been through this morning, as well as your experience of problems with the rollout of Legacy Horizon, did you have any concerns about the proposal to stay with Fujitsu? Um, I think it was discussed, not at length, but discussed briefly. I think the, the view was that um, going elsewhere um, could cause significant dislocation problems. Um, and I think, I think Rick and his team looked pretty closely at what we could and couldn't do. And the view was we needed to put Fujitsu under pressure, I think, to come forward with a better deal based on improved technology. That can come down now, thank you. Could we have on screen please POL 3081928? Going to page six please. Scrolling down a little. This is an email from Anne Chambers dated the 23rd of February 2006. The subject is Calendar Square. And the second paragraph of this email, I should clarify this is to Mike Stewart. Um, you're not on this no, email. No, this is through Jitsu. Yes. Um, but it, it, it's just a question as to some, whether or not you were aware of something in this email. The second paragraph says, haven't looked at the recent evidence, but I know in the past this site had hit this repost lock problem two or three times within a few weeks. This problem has been around for years and affects a number of sites most weeks. And finally, Isha say they have done something about it. I am interested in whether they really have fixed it, which is why I left the call open to remind me to check over the whole estate once S90 is live. Call me cynical, but I just I do not just accept a third party's word that they have fixed something. Had you ever heard of any issues at the Calendar Square branch? No. Going to page five of this document, please. The email from Gary Blackburn, dated the 1st of March. This is to Sean Turner at the post office. Sean, it appears that Calendar Square is not alone with its mismatch problem. It also appears that Fujitsu are expecting S90 release to resolve this quirk. We have opened a cross-domain problem report. It appears from these emails that release S90 was expected to resolve the Calendar Square problem would you agree with that? That's what it says. Could we have on screen, please, POL 3032210? These are the post office board minutes from the 20th of April 2006. Can we go to page 10, please? And apologies, before we go to page 10, just going back to page one, please. We can see that you were present at that meeting. I'm going to page 10, please. We can see there is an operations report about halfway down the page. 
and that covers the Horizon S90 release. And it said at B4 that this would provide for a plethora of change requests across a variety of existing capabilities. What do you understand that to be saying? Did that mean anything to you at the time? Um, well, that it was sweeping up a number of issues um, that should be sorted out by that release. Did you have any awareness that the S90 release was intended to fix the calendar square problem? No. That can come down, thank you. I'd like to turn, please, briefly to the relationship between the reliability of Horizon and the accuracy of the company accounts. The Horizon system recorded transactions for the business, and the accounts for the business were compiled based on the transactions recorded by the Horizon system. We've seen already the Ernst & Young letter to you way back in <clears> August <throat> of 1999. Would you agree that the board had to satisfy itself that the Horizon data could be relied upon, otherwise it couldn't be satisfied that the accounts were correct? It had to satisfy itself that all data. But I suspect that the some, Horizon data produced. Yeah, including Horizon. But I suspect, in terms of the accounts, there was some materiality here. Could we have on screen, please, POL 001 78249? This is described as the March 2004 Post Office Limited Horizon Electronic Cash Account Review. And scrolling down a little, please, it's from Ernst & Young, the external auditors, and it's sent for information to David Mills, Peter Corbett, you, Vicky Noble, Sue Harding, Alan Barry, Sue Lothar, Rod Ismay and Derek Foster. And just going to page two, please, the second paragraph. There is a, a background here set out on an annual basis to support Ernst & Young in their review of Post Office Limited's financial statements, IA and RM. Can you help with who that is? I can't, I'm afraid. Undertake a review of the Horizon System electronic cash account and the system interfaces to CBDB. The purpose of the review is to provide assurance on the effectiveness of the controls over the Horizon electronic cash account and the integrity of the data held on the Horizon and CBDB systems. In accordance with the terms of reference, the review covered all transactions undertaken by Great Moor Post Office for cash account week 35 in the 2003 to 2004 year. Do you recall this work being done or being aware of it? No. Based on that paragraph and a quick skim of the report, it appears that the analysis was done by reference only to one post office branch. Is that right? Uh, so it appears, yes. There is an equivalent report for March 2005. There's no need to turn that up, but the reference for the transcript is POL 0017853. Um, and I think you've been provided a copy of that quite recently as well, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And would you agree that likewise in that report, the analysis seems to be done by reference to one post office branch? Yes. Do you recall having any awareness of any kind of monitoring work like this being done in relation to the accounts? I was aware that the auditors were undertaking this work. Um, at the time, I wasn't aware of the scale of it, I have to say. I should have been, but I wasn't. B4, 
being aware of the scale of it now, do you consider it was a satisfactory way for the board to satisfy of the itself of the accuracy of the company accounts? It was very limited. That can come down, thank you. Just finally, um, at paragraphs 23 and 37, um, perhaps if we can start with paragraph 23 of your second statement. That's page seven. You say, I do not recall the poll board having oversight of criminal prosecutions. This was dealt with by the security and legal departments who were part of group. In hindsight, this seems to be a significant oversight by the board. And then paragraph 37, please. You say, Pol's corporate structure seemed to me to be adequate at the time. However, in retrospect, I have concerns about the degree of autonomy enjoyed by security and legal and the lack of poll oversight. What do you consider was the cause or, or the omission or lack in the governance structure that led to this lack of oversight? Well, subsequently, Post Office Limited as its own legal department, its own security department, as I understand it. And I think there was, um, during the years we are talking about, um, some reorganization and then very fast reorganization after that. And I think there were some organization issues that led to problems. And I think, um, the group control of legal and parts of security meant that Post Office Limited didn't have sufficient oversight of matters that should have been within its remit. You may be aware that Alan Cook, who gave evidence to the inquiry last week, his position was that he did not appreciate that post office were conducting private prosecutions of SPMs until 2009. What do you make of that? Um, I'm surprised he wasn't told. You were the temporary MD for two to three months before he took up the role and you handed over to him when he arrived. Do you think you bore any responsibility for drawing that to his attention or not? Um, probably. So those are my questions. Um, it is now one o'clock. I'm not sure whether core participants have questions or not. I think there are. There are at least two, possibly three, sets of core participants who have uh, some questions. Um, is now a convenient time to break for lunch? Yes, it is. I think um, not least because the transcriber should have a break. So we'll break until two o'clock. Thank you, sir.
Good afternoon, sir. Can you still see and hear us? Yes, I can. Um, Mr. Steen, Mr. Maloney and Ms. Page have some questions. Um, they estimate they will be no more than 15 minutes altogether, um, and they are going in that order, if that's all right, sir. Of course, it, and I'm um, smiling only because of the flexibility of these timings. And the microphone is not on. It, it is. Right, Mr. Let me try that again. My name is Sam Steen. I represent a large number of sub postmasters, mistresses, and indeed people that are employed within um, post office branches. Now, you said at the beginning of your evidence today, Mr. Miller, that you wanted to correct your statement, and you wanted to correct your statement regarding paragraph 51. Paragraph 51 of your statement, page 12, says you had no involvement with the design and implementation of the impact programme. And your correction was to say that you've seen documents that tell you that you are and were involved, sorry, as part of the impact programme. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Now, the impact programme um, was running in terms of design from 2003 and implementation came along in 2006, okay? All right. Now, do you recall that as part of the impact program, the ability for sub-postmasters to put monies in suspense, in other words, into dispute, was removed? Uh, I rem yes, I do, sorry. Right. Now, did you understand at the time that the reason why sub-postmasters would be wanting to put money into suspense, in other words, into dispute, was because they were suggesting that there is, um, they were not at fault for the shortfall? Did you understand that at the time? I understood that in some cases, Mr. Steen. Right. Yes. So why was it removed, Mr. Miller? Um, I think there was a overriding view in the business that they wanted to get an accounting system in that um, didn't allow for the um, effect of the suspense account previously. Right. Are you trying to say that it was removed because you didn't want sub-postmasters and mistresses to dispute shortfalls? No. Right. Well, that's the effect of it, Mr Miller. Try it again. Why was the suspense account removed? Um, right. Um, there, there, there was a view that previously the suspense account had been used for all sorts of things. Um, and that in the future they wanted it a lot, or we wanted it, I'm sorry, a lot cleaner. Um, but I, I'm not sure that the precise impact of what you are asking me about was fully comprehended. Right. Was one of the all sorts of things that the suspense account uh, was used for was to um, where the sub-postmaster was disputing their fault. Was that one of the things? Yes. Right. If you remove the suspense account, does that take away from the ability of a sub-postmaster to dispute the shortfall? No, I don't think it did. Right. What facility did they then have after the suspense account was removed well, they, to dispute Sorry, they could, there were discussions with the retail line and others about what was appropriate. Right. If you accept that one of the reasons for putting money into suspense is because a sub-postmaster is disputing that shortfall, yes? yes? You accept that, which you do, and then you remove that ability. Does that help the sub-postmaster dispute the shortfalls? No, it doesn't. Right. Now, think about this uh, slightly further, and I'll move on. If a sub-postmaster is stopped from disputing shortfalls, what does that do to the reporting of system problems? Does it help it? Um, I'm not sure how it affects it. I'm sorry. I'm just... Well, as an example, does it stop the person saying, look, there's a problem with your system? Maybe do something about it. Do you think that helps it? Um, no, I, I would dispute that it stopped it there. All right, let's move on. 
You say at paragraph 55 of your statement that Tony Marsh worked for the group security director with a dotted line to me, okay? Was there a dotted line from Tony Marsh, uh, the group security sent a director, to anyone else on the board? Uh, no. Right. So Tony Marsh reported to you. Is that correct? Um, technically, he reported to the group security director who did his appraisement every year, um, and within Post Office Limited, he had a dotted line to me. Right. So did the group security director report to you? No. Right. So why do you say there was a dotted line to me? What's the dotted line about? Uh, I, it was a, an organisational um, effect that said, actually, Tony may work for group, but he has to have some anchorage in Post Office Limited and will anchor him here. Right. You've spoken about the coin report. Do you remember the questions being asked earlier on today by Miss Price? Yeah? Yes. Sir. And you've said about the coin report, uh, this is in your evidence today, was that um, in relation to the expert's opinion, at the time, there was a lot of knocking of that report, both for Jitsu and Post Office. Okay? So your evidence seems to be that regarding the coin report, there was knocking of it by Fujitsu and Post Office. So let's take that in turn. What knocking of the coin report was there by Fujitsu? Um, I, I saw the inquiry um, question Jan Holmes, who is a senior auditor. Uh, there was a considerable discussion about his view of this report. And um, the discussion went to some lengths about what his view of it was and whether that was correct. At the time when you were dealing with the coin report and discussing it with Mr Marsh, was the knocking from post office via Mr Marsh about the coin report? There was a background noise from my company, Post Office Limited, that was basically saying, this is, this is not a good report, this is not a sound report. Who did that background noise come from? It came from a variety of places. Well, name one. Well, certainly when Tony spoke to me on the day that we have talked about earlier today, he was dismissive of that report, but there were, I suspect, back in the, in the bowels, as it were, of the organisation, there was um, significant people saying, this is no good. You suspect. Now, Mr Miller, some part of your evidence, it appears as though you're speaking from a, a kind of a distance, like an out-of-body experience. What do you mean you suspect that there was some talk within post office about it? Was there or was there not? Um, yes. Right. From who? Um, I, I know, I heard from Tony Marsh, um, I really don't know who else was saying these things. I'm afraid I don't. I'm sorry. Okay. You've also said this, both in your statement and in your evidence, you definitely did not read the report at the time. That's your evidence about it. It is. So... Are we to understand that you can think back to the time when you've got Mr Marsh in front of you and he's referring to this report? Are you saying that you can say in your own mind, from your recollection, um, no, thanks, Mr Marsh, I, I won't read it. It's OK, no problem. No, I didn't say right. that. Why are you saying you definitely didn't read it? Do you remember not reading it? I, when I read it, when it was made available to me for the second time via this inquiry... I had not read that. So Mr Marsh comes to you with a report that he's knocking, that you're hearing um, something going on in the background about from the post office knocking this report, and you decide not to read it. Is that what you're saying, Mr Miller? Uh, I didn't read it. I, you you know, saying... I made that very clear to this inquiry, what? that I didn't read it, and it's a matter of some regret to me. Right. Mr Miller, one of two things arise out of that. You're either lying through your teeth or you're a complete incompetent. Which? Uh, I'm not lying through my teeth. Right, so incompetence. 
if you wish to say that, yes. Or do you agree it's incompetence not to have read a report? I am in not, these circumstances. I am not happy that I didn't read that report. Paragraph 16 of your statement, you referred to the fact, similar to paragraph 15, you referred to the fact that Paul would from time to time pursue postmasters for the recovery of alleged shortfall branch accounts, including through civil proceedings, yes? But regarding the coin report, you agree, I believe, that you signed off the settlement in relation to the matter that was under discussion. Is that I right? I did. Yeah, okay. So, do you agree that you were the person in charge of the final decisions in relation to such matters as civil actions being taken against sub postmasters at that time? No. Who else was Mr. Marsh going to then when discussing the coin report? See, if Peter. Them? Corbett, the finance director, had not been on holiday, he would have, he would have gone to him. Or, or, I mean, Peter, that was in Peter's line, and Peter was due to sign that off. He was on holiday. Right. And Peter reported to? The managing director. Right. So on this particular occasion, on the only one occasion, when Mr Marsh is coming to you because Mr Corbett's away, you decide not to re re read a report that Mr Marsh is referring to, uh, to, re referring to in disparaging terms, and you just sign it off. Is that correct? I did. Oh, Mr Miller, how much did you earn during your period of time? What was your annual wage? Uh, um, that can be made available. What I, was it, Mr Miller? I don't know. Bonuses? Did you get bonuses? I got bonuses. Were they significant sums? Somewhere. that it, Mr. Steen? Yes, Mr. Maloney. So I'm grateful for your observation on fluidity of time estimates. It's now 12 minutes past two. And I, I anticipated that Mr. Steen was only going to be five minutes, but I'll try and be short uh, and, and not keep too long. Um, Mr. Miller, <clears throat> um, I've in fact been referred to during the course of your evidence this morning as somebody who asked you questions on the last time you attended. My name's Maloney. And um, it's agreed with Ms Price that it might be useful just to clear up any uncertainty about the evidence you gave when you first appeared before the inquiry, when I asked you questions. And um, so I'll just take just a minute on that, if I may, um, just to set the scene. At the, when you gave evidence to the board in July 1999, you'd been aware of the cash account problems. Yes? Yes. You'd also been aware from the NS NFSP meeting in June 1999 of the postmaster serious problems with Horizon, especially around balancing, that was affecting their physical and mental well-being. I'm aware. Yeah. But at the board, despite those difficulties, you were aware, you were aware of, of which you were aware, the minutes suggest that you said that Horizon was robust and fit for purpose. I the said that suggest. also, subsequently, yeah. there was discussion and that this didn't come out this morning. There was discussion of other issues related, and that is minuted in those in those board minutes. Yes, yeah. and 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 after and, and, and I asked you. You said at the time that you couldn't remember saying that. That's what you said to Mr. Blake, and I asked you if you had any reason to doubt the accuracy of those minutes, and you said you didn't. And you clarified that you definitely did not say that Horizon was not fit for purpose and not robust, but you. Later on, after that, after that meeting, found out about the Ernst and Young letter on audit integrity and various other matters, and you said that you um, should have looped around to the board, um, bypassing Mr. Sweetman, whose responsibility you thought it was to inform the board of those things. I think there was some discussion of that. I can't recall yeah. saying precisely that, Mr. Maloney. Okay. And today, in answer to questions from Ms Price, you said that on overall reflection, I should have told the lawyers in IT that Horizon was a new system coming in and they should be very cautious about evidence coming out of that system. That they should check the evidence coming out of that yeah. system. Yeah. And then subsequent to the board meeting, we've seen this morning that you were involved in Mr Andrews' case, Horizon outages, and you had some involvement in the Cleveland's case. You were taken to the 
board minutes of December 2004, and you were tasked to ensure that post office could recover the pensions of fraudsters, yes? Uh, I, I was tasked with yeah, that. I made some comment on that. But yeah. Somebody else on the board had raised this, you say? Yes. Yeah. Was this not an opportunity, given that those fraudsters were sub-postmasters, for you to raise your concerns that Horizon was a new system coming in and everybody should be very cautious about the evidence that came out of that system? Had I known what I now know, the answer would be yes. And finally, if I may, um, Mr Miller, um, could I ask that the October board minutes that we've been to before, which are POL 30s, 95506 are put up. And could we go to page four, please? And we see there, um, if, if we could just, uh, it's at 22, the NFSP subsidy, this may be sufficient. Reconsider the subsidy provided to the NFSP if they continue to undermine the position of Post Office Limited. And this is a board at, at meeting at which you were present, and the specific action was to assess competing financial services products and to communicate that these would not be covered by our compliance and AML training, that's anti-money laundering training. The latter has been done via focus communications and an article will be appearing in the sub-postmaster. A list of competing products is being compl compiled. Considering the continuation of the NFSP subsidy will be undertaken in the light of overall developments and information gathered covering products, e.g. including travel. Do you remember this issue at all, Mr Miller? I do. Was this that there'd been a, uh, an NFSP meeting where there'd been a stall at that meeting uh, with a, as it were, a rival um, firm. That's correct. Services. Yeah. Was Post Office conscious that its subsidy of NFSP could be taken away if the NFSP undermined it? Um, was it, did it know it could do that? Yeah. I think so. Was it conscious that this might be leverage with the NFSP? I'm sure it was. Yeah, which is why the specific action was to assess competing financial services products and to communicate, to presumably to the NFSP, that these would not be covered by our compliance and AML training. Did you consider that that consciousness of the, and what's been portrayed here was a healthy attitude from the business to an association which was supposed to represent the interests of postmasters? No and presumably especially not those postmasters who were the subject of civil debt recovery proceedings. Oh. Nor indeed those past postmasters who were the subject of criminal proceedings and asset recovery to the extent of their pensions being taken. Yes. Thank you, Mr Miller. Ms Page. Thank you, sir. Very briefly. Mr Miller, on the program board for impact you sat as what was called a senior user didn't you yes the program was intended to um quotes leverage and simplify the technology landscape that means in effect that it was an extension of horizon doesn't it um or horizon was an extension of it yes it was part of the overall uh, infrastructure. So it was built into and onto and around the existing Horizon infrastructure, yes? Yes. Did you ever think to make sure that the people involved with it had read Jeremy Folkes's document to you about the problems with Horizon and the things to look out for? I didn't. And why not? I just didn't. Is the I'm real... not saying I shouldn't have done, but I didn't. Is the real issue here with some of the uh, points that you have 
very fairly recognised you should have done or that you might have done differently, is the real issue here that you and post office board were keen to forget or deny the problems with Horizon as soon as you could? No. Thank you, sir. Those are my questions. Thank you, Ms. Page. Uh, is that it, Ms. Price? Uh, yes, it is, sir. Um, if right. you're content, sir, um, the plan would be to move directly to Mr. Mill's evidence once Mr. Miller is completed, subject yes. to any questions from you. No, no, I've, I've asked a few questions that I have as we've been going along. So thank you, Mr. Miller, for making yourself available, both by writing a second witness statement and by coming today for the second time. I'm grateful to you for participating in this way in the inquiry. Thank you, sir. Right. I'll just disappear from the screen momentarily, Ms. Price, while I get my hard copy of the next witness's evidence. All right. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. May I call Mr. Mills? Yes, of course. I swear by Almighty God. 
I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth thank you thank you Thank you, Mr Mills. Please could I ask you to state your full name? David John Mills. Thank you for giving evidence to the inquiry today. You should have in front of you a witness statement dated the 8th of March 2024 and running to 141 paragraphs. Do you have that? I do. For the record, um, the Witness reference number is WITN 10950100. Before we turn to your signature, Mr Mills, I understand there's one small correction you would like to make. Yes, please. It's at page 8 of the statement, paragraph 24. And... It's in respect of the second sentence. Thereafter, the meetings occurred on a monthly basis until I left Paul Post Office Limited in 2006. Correct. And what change would you like to make? I would like it to read in 2005, please. Thank you. It, as it says at paragraph two of your witness statement, you held the position at Post Office Limited until 31st of December 2005. That's correct, Mr. Stevens. Could I ask you please to turn to page 38 of the statement? I have it. Thank you. Is that your signature? Yes, it is. And subject to that one change, uh, can you confirm that the statement is true to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is. Thank you, Mr Mills. That now stands as your evidence in the inquiry. It will be published on the website shortly. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions about it. Thank you. You, as you've just said, you were the Chief Executive of Post Office Limited from uh, 15th of April 2002 until the 31st of December 2005. Correct. And before then you had a career in banking? I did. And am I right that your last role before Post Office Limited was as General Manager of Personal Banking for HSBC UK? Correct. Uh, was that a board role? No. Uh, had you held any board roles before Post Office Limited? Many. Uh, had you ha held a managing, a managing director or CEO role? Not in those words, no. But a, 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 kin a, a role akin to... But in practice, yes. Thank you. We don't need to turn it up. I want to look at the the board you came to um, in paragraph 52 of your witness statement which is page 15 you say uh, as I note the above when I joined Post Office Limited there were irregular board meetings on arrival at Post Office Limited the board was therefore not exercising proper or effective oversight of any function Could you explain why the board wasn't exercising oversight uh, at that when you arrived at Post Office Limited? The board wasn't functionally organised. Um, it only had four directors. They met infrequently and not on a regular basis. And they dealt with matters that were of importance to Royal Mail Group. Uh, they were not into the detail of running the company. You mentioned that there were four directors. Yes. Uh, the first was uh, a chief executive, is that right? Or should I say, when you joined, there were, there was a, you were appointed as chief executive? Yes, but that's not one of the four directors. That was before my time, when I, I was trying to illustrate to you that the board was not, I didn't think, in control of Post Office Limited. So what were the four uh, <coughs> directors' roles when you joined? Uh, they didn't have specific roles in the sense that I created in the board that I subsequently made and managed. There was the chief executive of Royal Mail Group, 
there was the chief executive of Royal Mail, Royal Mail. there was uh, David Miller, the chief operating officer, and there was the finance director, Peter Corbett, and that was it. <coughs> if you do need some water, please. Thank you, I'm grateful to you. That was the board. Was there a separate executive management team uh, that sat below that board? Yes, eventually. Um, as I say, when I got there, I, I didn't think there was a functioning board. So I went about establishing what I thought were the normal functions of a conventional board of a very large company. And I established roles, for example, IT director, for example, sales and marketing director. All of the normal functions that you would have expected existed in a normally large company. Those positions were held by members of the executive team. So we not only had board meetings, but we had executive team meetings. And for example, we had board meetings that met bi-monthly, we had executive team meetings that met monthly, and then all of the executives met every morning at nine o'clock on a Monday. Sorry, not every morning. Met every Monday at nine o'clock. So the, the, you, you say in your statement um, that you, you saw um, building a proper board structure as, a, as an important matter. Critical. Was that something you took on yourself or was it a direction given to you by someone else? No, it was something that I felt was essential to running a an extremely large company. You referred to, in your evidence, making roles on the board for IT. Yes. Was that Alan Barry who fulfilled <coughs> the role at the start? It was, yes. For sales and marketing, that was the other role you referred Gordon to. Gordon Steele. And in your evidence, you also refer to HR. Correct. And who fulfilled that? John role? Main. And they were not appointed immediately as directors because Post Office Limited was insolvent. Um, it, it was a crisis. Yes, and is it fair to say that your, you saw the, your priority, your key priority, as bringing Post Office Limited back to solvency? Well, I didn't realise that when I was appointed, but very, it didn't take me very long to realise that uh, we, we had a burning ship. It was losing a million pounds every single day it operated. Um, Can I ask, uh, so we've looked at IT, sales, marketing, HR, you've referred to finance and operations already, operations being David Miller. Did you give consideration as to whether there should be other roles represented at the board? Yes, we had, uh, eventually we had a banking director um, and um, uh, we also had, gosh, now what else is it? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't recall what else it was, but there were two more roles. We'll come to this in more detail in future, did, but when we're dealing at the start, so when you, when you arrived, did you ever consider appointing something akin to a general counsel or head of legal for Post Office Limited? Definitely not. Why? Uh, well, those roles uh, on the legal front were undertaken by the legal function of Royal Mail Group. We had really quite a strange arrangement in as much as uh, a number of central functions of the Royal Mail Group were undertaken for and on behalf of Royal Mail and Post Office Limited. So in a sense, there was no need for a general counsel role for Post Office Limited because there was already one in existence at group level that one could draw upon. Did you have any oversight of the uh, Royal Mail Legal Department uh, in your position as a director on the Royal Mail Board? No, none at all. Um, did you, at the time, consider that to be problematic where uh, you, the legal function was uh, dealt with by uh, a bo the central, sorry, parent body over which you didn't have oversight? Yes, I did. Did you communicate that concern to anyone? It, it, it took a little time for it to dawn on me that I wasn't comfortable. When did it dawn on you? Oh, 
It probably took at least six months for it to dawn on me. And what was the concern? No, there wasn't a concern uh, in the sense of the strength of the concern. It was merely a fact that I didn't have my own personal arms around these central functions and therefore could tell them directly what I wanted them to do, to do and therefore was in control of their pay and rations and if they didn't like it, well, I could tell them what to do with their pay and rations. We'll come back to that when looking at um, prosecutions in, in due course. Uh, before I move on, I want to look at some other uh, corporate structure issues. Um, Michael Hodgkinson was appointed as an independent chair in 2003, is that yes. right? Uh, were you involved in his appointment? No, not at all. Were you satisfied that an independent... Oops, sorry, I'll rephrase that. What were your views on uh, an independent chair being brought in? Oh, I was pleased. Why? Well... <laughs> I think I probably hadn't realised quite how big Post Office Limited was when I took on the job, and I certainly hadn't realised the condition that it was in. And having someone as wise and as thoughtful and as experienced as Sir Mike on the board was just manna from heaven. And in February 2005, Alan Cook was appointed as a non-executive director. Yes. Did you have any involvement in his appointment? Uh, to the extent that I discussed it with um, Alan Layton, yes. I'd, I'd known uh, Cook from NSNI days because I used to deal with him when I was with HSBC or Midland Bank. So I knew the man. What uh, were your views of his appointment? I was pleased. Why? Well, here was another man who was experienced. He'd had a long time in the financial services industry. I wasn't surrounded by people who knew about that industry. And that's the direction that I thought was the solution to the Post Office Limited's problems. He'd also had good experience dealing with government departments, so he was a good choice. I want to look at your role as Chief Executive, please. Um, do you, would you accept that as Chief Executive... Uh, you had ultimate executive accountability for the operation of Post Office Limited? Of course. Would you agree that identifying, analysing and managing risk is an important part of running a company? Definitely. Would you, is it fair to say that that goes to the heart of the role of the company executive? Yes. Do you accept that good risk management requires an executive to be proactive in identifying risks? Yes, you can't just hope they come and jump up before you. You've got to go and find them. And that applies to the chief executive as well as the people uh, who report to him or her? Of course. Did Post Office Limited maintain risk registered when you joined the company? No. When did Post Office Limited start to maintain risk registers? I'm not exactly sure. Um, but the first thing that Sir Michael Hodgkinson did was to decide we needed a risk committee um, and he established it and chaired it. And I thought to myself, well, that's jolly good because we've got somebody now with good professional experience chairing the committee that needed to look at these things and that's something that I can leave to Mike. I was very happy to do that um, whilst I got on with other things. I remember, I, I, I really would like to remind you that I was trying to deal with the biggest risk of all that this company faced. This company, without a question of doubt, faced going under. Now, that wasn't just a risk that affected all of the people within it, or with all the suppliers, or anything like that at all. Post offices were everywhere. They were, there wasn't a village that they weren't in. So if post office had gone under, that would have been seriously deleterious for this country. Yes, Mr Mills, uh, I, it's in your witness statement, as you say, the, the serious risk that insolvency, um, the, the, well, the, the risk that faced Post Office Limited. Can I just clarify on the risk register point, please? Do you think that was introduced after Sir Michael Hodgkinson uh, was appointed? I yeah. think it would have been, but I d I'm sorry, I don't know. How was risk 
and the risk management handled prior to a risk register being implemented? I don't know. When you joined as chief executive, what steps did you take to identify the risks that faced the business? I'm sorry, I thought I'd made it clear. I didn't identify the risks on a one-by-one -one basis as you're discussing. My first priority was to try and set a course that stopped the company from going bankrupt. It took me at least six months to really understand what was going on. This was a very non-trivial company. I didn't have any briefing whatsoever about it. I had no papers, no people telling me what was going on. I had to try and discover all of these things myself. So I'm sorry, but I didn't go around trying to build a, 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 a number of what are the risks. Do you, um, in effect, then, it, uh, your, you, in terms of the resources you had, that was fully occupied with looking at the solvency and you didn't have the resources to deal with the, for example, a risk register. Is that your evidence? It's sort of my answer. I mean, you're putting words into my mouth. I didn't have the brain power to cope with any more than I was coping with during those first six months. I'm very sorry, but I didn't. Before I move on, uh, can I ask if your remuneration was fixed or performance-based? First of all, it was fixed. And then um, I recall that the Secretary of State made it extremely clear to Alan Layton that she expected the senior executive of the entire group to have remuneration that was performance-based and that the targets for that performance should be stretching and that the rewards for that stretching success would, were not to be miserly. They should be generous. So you recall? It, it, uh, Sorry. I, I eventually joined a thing called the LTIP, the Long-Term uh, Improvement Plan or something like that. Do you recall how your performance was measured? I do, yes. I had quite serious meetings with Alan Layton, who wanted to know what I'd done and when I'd done it. And what specifically did he want to know you had done? Turn the company into profit. So it's profit-based targets? No, I didn't say that. You asked me what specifically did he want to know, and I told you. It was, he wanted to know whether I was going to get this company into profit. Sorry, let me rephrase the question. Um, in terms of how your performance was measured, was it measured by reference to uh, how successful you were or, or your plan was to bring the company back to profit? Well, one of the measurements was, did I create a strategic plan that held for the next three years and was approved by government? That would have been one of the things. But, but I, want to re I really want to en try and emphasise to you that the whole thing was about... Can we save this place? Mr Mills, in your evidence, you, you refer to that. You also say, we, we can bring this up actually, it's um, in the witness statement, page 4, paragraph 12, please. Yes, I have it. So just waiting for it to follow on the screen. Thank oh, I'm so sorry. Um, no need to apologise. You refer to, as well as the overriding objective to make the company profitable, I was also conscious of my other obligations as Chief Executive and as a Director of Post Office Limited. Um, you go on to say, I was throughout conscious of my duty as a Director to ensure that the company was run in an honest, effective and ethical manner. And finally, you say, further, I understood that my duties were not only owed to existing shareholders, but also to the wider organisation, including Post Office Limited's employees, and to ensure it had a viable future. And that can come down, thank you. Uh, are you... So postmasters aren't employees, are they? Not in the conventional sense, but for the purpose of this inquiry, you could regard them as so. Did you see your duty as a director to include uh, considering how changes in management affected sub-postmasters? Definitely. Yes, definitely. One last question on corporate governance before I move on. 
did you apply or take into account any codes uh, of practice or codes that were relevant to corporate governance and management? No, not in the sense that you mean. Uh, in the sense that you meant, were, was I following the normal corporate codes, for example, of the uh, Companies Act 2006? Um, uh, what I was trying to do was follow the general ethical codes that I'd learned through 40 years being in one of the UK's biggest banks. Um, and the ethical codes that were employed there were very, very strict indeed. Um, and worked. And I was doing my best to employ m many of the lessons that I'd learnt over that period in Post Office Limited. To have, to have tried to cover them with regulatory work at the time that I was trying to do it would not have been possible. You would not have been able to change the organisation at the pace that that needed. Um, Please can I just clarify that you, when you refer in your evidence a moment ago to ethical code that you learned or gained experience of over years, is, yeah. are you referring to a specific written ethical code or general experience that you picked up in running various companies? Well, not just that. I was on uh, a number of regulatory bodies, including the Personal Investment Authority. Uh, I was also in, uh, on their arbitrary counts and so forth. So I was very familiar with the way in which regulatory bodies handled large companies, uh, admittedly all in the banking sector. Yes, but the, when, you, when you use a specific word, ethical code, are you referring to a particular written document? No, I'm not. No, thank you. We'll turn then to, to uh, looking at some issues relating to Horizon. Please could we bring up page five of the witness statement, paragraph 14. And this is picking up on a theme you mentioned earlier. You say, when I joined Paul, Post Office Limited, I was barely briefed on anything by anyone. Even the building security team was not expecting me on my first day. I arrived to an empty open plan office and began work. And at paragraph 15, you refer to the priority to when you started Paul, after getting an understanding of the business to formulate a strategic plan. You say also in your statement that you knew about the Horizon system and you say that it was delivered quite some time before my arrival. Uh, who gave you any, any information, I'll rephrase that, sorry. Uh, the information you had on Horizon, who gave that to you? Miller. David Miller? Yes, David Miller. And when did he give you that information? Probably on my first day. Did he, when speaking to you, did he refer to uh, any of the difficulties that uh, Post Office Limited had faced during the trial and rollout of Horizon? No. no mainly our conversations revolved around the fact that um, uh, Horizon had been started as a way of automating uh, the um, hmm, transactions of... Uh, gosh, who the devil was it? I'm sorry. It's called old age. Um, the benefits agency. The benefits agency. I'm very sorry. Do forgive me. No need to apologise. Um, so they got a long way with automating what the benefits agency wanted, and then eventually the benefits agency said, "No, we don't want all that. Uh, it's all costing too much. We can do these things differently, and we're pulling out." So that left the post office with a, a major decision. Uh, did they take this system and try and amend it, or did they write it off? If they would have written it off, it would have been a massive write-off for the government, just the, a huge hit on the bottom line of a company that was already insolvent. 
So they decided that they would uh, refurbish this organ, this thing, and try and use it to unbelievably uh, automate the entire back office of the post office, all in one go. Well, that was what I knew about Horizon. And um, please, can we bring up your witness statement, page 26, please, paragraph 91. That's great, thank you. Uh, if we can have 90 and 91 together, please. Thank you. Uh, similar to what you said, you refer at the end of 90 to the system being repurposed in a way to automate the entire back office of the branch network. And you say, with hindsight, Horizon should not have been repurposed in that way. Um, it's become evident that it was not fit for purpose. At the time, were you given any impression or any understanding that the repurposing of the system had a negative effect on the actual end product? Uh, no one has specifically mentioned it, um, but I would easily have expected it. Um, I had been the IT director of Midland Bank and we had rewritten the entire retail banking system for the bank. And there was only one way to do that. It was not to try and remake the elephant all in one go. It was to bite it in tiny pieces. Were you sceptical then of the, 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 as you describe it, the repurposing of... Definitely. Did you do anything on the... Because, did you do anything because of your scepticism? Yes. What did you do? Well, it was pretty obvious that... Horizon was not going to be written off, nor was it going to be closed down. No one would have accepted that in government or, or, or indeed in the wider surroundings. So uh, I made it very clear very early on that uh, we had to do a number of things with Horizon. The first thing was to reduce its cost, because remember, my primary activity was to try and keep this thing afloat. So we needed to reduce its cost to something like you would normally expect a company to be paying for its IT. Now, we were paying well above what you could have expected, and normally that would have been 15% of non-interest expenditure. It's sort of a you know, rule of thumb sort of thing. So I basically said we must reduce the costs of Horizon, and at the same time we must begin to think now about how are we going to replace it within the contractual term, which was basically five years hence. And that's the amount of time you really need to think about how you replace a system of this size and scope and complexity. Did you at any point think that you needed to investigate uh, how robust or how adequate the system was in recording transaction data? No, not at the transaction data level. I thought very early on that I needed to understand what was happening to this system in the hands of the user. Um, so it was not at all unusual for me to go out and directly visit um, sub-postmasters who were using the system to ask them how they were getting on with it, what were the problems with it, what were the good things about it, how were things happening in their branch. And that, that was a, you know, I did that regularly. Um, and we also set up a model office because very often, even with a very well-performing IT system, you can create a model environment and examine it forensically to see how it's working, what we can do to improve it. You know, if the glass of water is over there, that's too far to reach. We want the glass of water here. So many, many tiny things can be done to make a performing system perform much better. Why did your scepticism not include um, how it recorded transaction data? Sorry, how the Horizon IT system recorded transaction data? I don't know. Maybe it's because in those days of I mean, this is very early days for computers in the scheme of things, and in those days most people thought that 
computers did work and that they produced an answer that was logical and reasonable and would do the finished job. Also, don't forget that this thing had been run, it had been piloted, it had been acceptance tested, so it, it had gone through many stages before I was there. It had been live for two years before I arrived. Did you ask anyone about how the uh, rollout, the testing, the pilot went and how, how Post Office Limited, how satisfied it was with the rollout, testing and pilot? Yes, of course I did. I just said I was talking to sub-postmasters on a regular basis, a very regular basis. So that was with sub-postmasters? Yes. What about um, anyone in the Post Office <laughs> IT department? Uh, no, I didn't actually, because in a sense we didn't have an IT department, we had Fujitsu. I mean, that was the IT department in reality. What about Alan Barry? Yes, he was the IT director, but he didn't have a load of code writers behind him. And of course I did ask him, obviously, you know, how things were going and what was happening. Did you feel that you had sufficient IT expertise within Post Office Limited to properly understand whether Horizon was adequate? No. Why did you not try to address that? I did. How? Recruiting Rick Francis, for example, who was the IT director who succeeded Alan Barry. And in all of this, when you're talking about pilot, the asking questions about the pilot and the testing, etc., um, you may have covered this in your evidence already, but just to be sure, did you uh, discuss that with David Miller? Yes. Yeah. Miller, uh, Miller is a crucial man in this. He, he is very thoughtful. He worked extremely hard. He was running the network, and he was running the network with aplomb, in my view, given the things that we were trying to do. Please could um, we bring up your witness statement, page 34, paragraph 124. You say that I've been asked whether I was concerned by the nature or frequency of allegations made by sub-postmasters that Horizon was defective. To be clear, whilst at Post Office Limited, I was not aware of complaints to the effect that Horizon was compromised. I can come down, thank you. Can we also now bring up POL 20328107? This is a letter from Dave Barrett of Post Office Limited. Uh, it's dated the 29th of October 2003. Um, Dave Barrett's job title was Head of Commercial Urban Area Wales, the Marshes and Merseyside. Uh, did you know who Dave Barrett was? No. As you'll see, um, it refers to a letter about Alan Bates sent by um, Betty Williams MP. And in the second paragraph, it refers to Post Office terminating Mr Bates' contract because of a loss of confidence in his willingness to conduct the job in the manner expected. Uh, were you aware of Alan Bates at around this time? No, not at all. If you turn to page four, please. This is a letter from Betty Williams, MP, to Stephen Timms, MP, who was Minister of State for E-Commerce, Energy and Postal Services. Uh, do you remember Mr Timms, MP? I remember Stephen very well indeed. 
and he was the minister at the Department for Trade and Industry um, when you were managing director. Yes, an excellent man. You will see in that letter, uh, Betty Williams MP, if we go down, I yeah, think there, thank you. Um, refers to a conversation which he'd had with Mr. Barrett, um, and he and says his attitude was wholly unacceptable. So his, his arrogant attitude was wholly unacceptable, and uh, her complaint. Well, she asked Mr. Um, Timms to make a complaint to Alan Layton uh, on uh, regarding the matter. If we turn to page seven, please. This is Stephen Tim's letter in reply to Betty Williams on the 17th of November 2003. At the bottom, it says, however, in view of your concerns, I have passed your correspondence to David Mills, the Chief Executive of Post Office Limited, and have asked him to investigate the matter and respond to you direct. And over the page, we see Mr. Tim's letter to you. Do you recall receiving this letter? I, I don't, um, but I'm not, uh, not at all surprised that Stephen sent it to me. Um, I like Stephen a lot. We got on very well. He worked extremely hard to do his job, and I would have done anything I could to have helped him. Uh, would you have expected a letter from... Uh, the minister responsible for the post office to be put onto your desk? No, 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 I'm not saying that. I, I'm, what I'm saying is that I'm not at all surprised that Stephen wrote to me. Well, I, I'll, I'll ask you, so I, would you expect a letter um, sent by the minister responsible for the post office? Yeah, I, yes, I would have done, yes. Um, do you think, you say you can't recall it, do you think on balance it's likely you would have received this? I probably did, yes. Um, and probably I'd have taken the wrong thing out of it. Uh, I would have been probably incensed that one of our area managers, or whatever his name was, had been rude and arrogant and so forth to Betty Williams. Um, and if you look at her note, uh, she's got a handwritten note, you can see that it does seem that this chap was not good with her. And so I'd have probably progress that rather than Mr Bates which I'm you know I'm not saying right at all I'm saying that's what I think I might have done but you it, it's apparent you can't actually remember what you did no I'm sorry I can't no. uh, please could we turn to page nine of the same document thank you um, this is a letter on the 11th of November 2003, again to Betty Williams MP, this time from Alan Bates. Uh, so the, the 11th of November, just before Stephen Tim's letter to you. Uh, in the fourth paragraph down, It says, the comments made in his letter about lost confidence, that's referring back to the termination reason, etc., is really just a smokescreen to try to justify their actions from their position. The real truth behind all this are the problems with the Post Office Horizon system and the lengths that Post Office will go to to keep it covered up. Uh, in the next paragraph down, it says, with regard to the response you received from the Minister, I can see that Post Office is using its contractual issue ploy with him again, but it really needs to look into the Horizon issues. It is Horizon which is in one way or another is causing the problems. And then over the page, please. The second paragraph down says, Post Office Limited are terrified about the real facts with Horizon being known, and it seems they will stop at nothing to keep them hidden. If we move on to page 11, please. It's a letter from Betty Williams to Stephen Timms on the 19th of November, enclosing the letter we've just referred to by Mr Bates. 
And then finally, please, if we can go to page 12. Mr Tim's response on the 8th of January. The bottom of the second paragraph he says, however, in view of the concerns raised by Mr. Bates as to the validity and reliability of Post Office Limited's Horizon computer system, which he sees as a factor in his dispute, I have had my officials contact the company to receive their response to the issues raised. Goes on to, to discuss Horizon, um, but then says, I understand that the management of Post Office Limited do not share Mr. Bates' concerns and are fully confident as to the reliability of the Horizon system goes on to say they have found no evidence to suggest there is any fault with the Horizon system and maintain that decision to terminate Mr Bates' contract was legitimate. Do you recall being made aware of these concerns by Mr Bates? No. Given the, relation, or the working relationship you had with Mr Timms at the time, is it likely that you would have been made aware of those concerns? No, I don't see the connection with your question. Well, what, earlier in your evidence, you said you worked closely with Mr. T well, you, were, you had a good Yes, but I'm sorry, you're trying to connect that with people giving me evidence that there was something wrong with Horizon, which I didn't have. OK, let's take it in stages, Mr Mills. Firstly, based on your working relationship with Mr Timms, do you think um, you would have discussed the concerns raised by Alan... Bates with him? No, because I wasn't aware of those concerns. So, um, is your evidence, or what you think happened, Mr Timms raised it with the company, but raised it with someone else? I, I think so, looking at this correspondence. Who else in the company um, would be responsible for dealing with requests such as this from the Department of Trade and Industry? Um... I'm not sure. Uh, it depends to where it was addressed, but if it was something of an IT type, it would have been Alan Barry. So is your evidence that Alan Barry would have had a direct line of report to the Department of Trade and Industry? No, I didn't say that. So uh, who then? Other I than don't know is the answer to your question. How often did you meet with Mr Timms around this time? No, I didn't meet with him regularly. I spoke on the telephone. How often did you speak with him on the telephone? Oh, infrequently. How, when you say infrequently? Three or four. Three or four, what? How to, is that times a month or...? No, in total. In total? Yes. Three or four times. Over how long of a period? The length of the time that I was with the post office. Can we move on, please? Uh, Actually, sir, this is probably a good time to take a short break because it's a moving to a different topic. Certainly. Um, do you want a, a, a 10 minute break? A 15 I, break? I think 10 minutes will be fine, sir. Thank you. If we could say uh, 20 past. All right. Fine. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Good afternoon, sir. Can you still see and hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move to the case, uh, case of Cleveleys, please, uh, and start with poll 00158493. This is an email from Keith Baines. It says to David J. Mills. That's you, isn't it? Yes, that's me. And uh, Keith Baines is noted as the contract, a contract manager at Post Office Limited in the IT directorate. Uh, do you recall working with Keith Baines? Uh, no, but I know who he is. He negotiated a lot with Fujitsu. The subject is action from your visit to the IT commercial team meeting. Yes. Uh, what was the IT commercial team meeting? Well, it was just a visit to the IT, so I knew, or get a feel for the people working there and ask them probably inane questions, but helped me to learn more about the business. And it says, David, you asked who in post office was instructing the lawyers in the case referred to in the following risk uh, on the IT risk register. Uh, pausing there, do you remember what the IT ri risk register was? Yes. What yes. was it? It was just a, 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 a register of those risks that the IT thought may affect them and or the company. And who had access to the IT risk register? I'm sorry, I don't know. Who was responsible for putting risks on the IT risk register onto the Post Office Limited Board's risk register? Well, ultimately, it would be Alan Barry and or Rick Francis subsequently. But if you were aware of a risk on the IT risk register, presumably you would accept responsibility for putting that onto the main board's risk register as well? Yes, I would, but uh, I wouldn't have done in this case because I was just on a walk around and noticed this particular risk which I asked about. So the risk says there, damage to reputation of post office and potential future financial losses if post office loses court case relating to reliability of horizon accounting data at Cleveland's branch office. What did that mean to you at the time when you read it? Well, actually, that meant nothing to me at the time. What did catch my eye was that the potential financial loss was a million pounds. It was a million pounds? Yes. Well, looking... So, so naturally, I said to this fellow Baines, you know, let me know about that, please. I want to want know more about it. Taking it in stages from what that um, says uh, and what it is, firstly, someone's brought a court case against Post Office Limited. Yes? Yes. And part of that court case concerns the reliability of the Horizon accounting data. Yes? Yes. yes. And the IT department had considered that to be a risk worthy of going on the IT risk register. Correct. So the risk related to IT and not, for example, just a, a general legal risk. No. Everyone was supposed to be identifying their own risk. This was an IT risk. And there's, it says there's damage to reputation of post office <laughs> and future financial losses. What um, did you understand the future financial losses to be? A million pounds. But what, from, from the saying that the, the amount is in a, milli, a million pounds, how did you understood the post office risked losing a million pounds? I didn't know. I didn't understand that. I saw a risk register. It was registering a figure of a million pounds. Anyone with any brains would have said, I need to know more about this. There's sufficient information there, isn't there, to see that uh, someone was putting uh, the reliability of Horizon into issue in court proceedings? Yes. There is. Did that concern you? No, because I asked about it to find out about it. So I, I, just reading that, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't even have taken that in when I read it. What I would have taken in is a million pounds. What, when you asked about it, what were you told? This is the response. Ah, sorry. So um, if that can come back up, sorry. We'll wait for that to come back up.
while Mr. Stevens is waiting for that to be put back up, the, the, the million pounds that you've mentioned, um, <coughs> Mr. Mills, actually it's the first time I think I've heard that figure. Was that something written on the risk register, register or was that something you learned from another source? No, I think it was written on the risk registers. Right. So we can assist with that. Um, I'll go to it in a moment once this Fine. once yeah. we're finished on the document. Thank you. Um, so I asked what what question you raised about this, and you said this is the response. Yeah, correct. Um, this still doesn't tell you what the challenge to the uh, reliability of the IT system was, does it? Correct. It does not. Did what you ask what that was? No. Why not? I wasn't that clever. I'm sorry, I didn't ask about it. Well, let's look. If we if we look to the next paragraph, it describes who's providing instructions. It says the case is scheduled for the week, com week commencing 16th of August, and we have offered settlement and paid money into court based on what the supposed mistress would have received for three months' notice. Correct. Did it not concern you that an offer of settlement had been made in a case where uh, the reliability of the Horizon IT system was an issue? No, because I hadn't properly assimilated the fact that the reliability of Horizon was in doubt. I hadn't got that in my mind. What I'd got in my mind was £1 million, and looking at this uh, email, it looked pretty certain to me that we were going to settle for three months' notice. And at the level that I was operating at, that seemed an end to that issue. Let's look at the risk register then, please. This is an Excel document. Um, it's POL 20120833. And if we could open the risk ops P5 tab. Thank you. So we see uh, at the top uh, Director at IT, Commercial, and then Alan Barry. So that's the IT director who reported to you. The same risk is in the first line, it's in the description. And the risk is set at a million pounds. Action. Royal Mail Legal Services have made an offer for out-of-court settlement of the case, review with Fujitsu of their processes to protect against similar future cases. Did you not want to know what this review with Fujitsu uh, entailed? No, because I haven't read this risk register. This is the first time I've seen this. Other than, this may have been what I saw on my walk around. Yes, uh, uh, I was going to say... But I don't know that it was because this isn't in my mind. And, and looking at it, you can see why it probably wouldn't have been. If I'd have been going around looking at desks and looking at risk registers and looking at this, and I'd have looked at the first line and it said risk a million, well, I'd have probably put that in my little notebook and said, tell me about that. When it says risk a million for potential future financial losses um, in the description, were you not concerned that the future financial losses may be connected to the criticisms of the Horizon IT system and how it stored data? No, because I hadn't spotted the criticisms of the Horizon IT system. What I'd spotted was a million pounds. Do you think you should have spotted the criticism? No, I don't. Why not? That's, if, if I'd have concentrated on any issue at that level, I'd have never, ever got anywhere near to turning the post office round. This was for Alan Barry to deal with, not me. Alan Barry, um, as you say, is the IT director, but you accepted earlier that um, ultimate executive accountability for the post office limited lay with you. Of course. The Horizon IT system was a system that put together, uh, uh, sorry, recorded transaction data held yes. by branches, yes? Yes. 
And from that data, uh, Post Office Limited used that data, sorry, to put together its management and statutory accounts, correct? Yes. It was important that the data was reliable, correct? Yes. And you knew all of that at the time? Of course. I ask again, do you think when you saw a risk register that set, referred to a challenge to the integrity of Horizon, that you should have asked more questions as to what that challenge, sorry, the challenge to the integrity was? I, I, th I think I've said this already, but I think I said to you that I hadn't assimilated that point. The point that I had assimilated is one million pounds. Now, whether I should have followed up on things that I hadn't assimilated, I think is really hypothetical. I'll move on um, from that risk register to something related. Um, could we go to WITN 00, actually no, sorry, before we go there. Um, please, can we go to POL? Zero zero one four two five zero three. This is an email from Rod Ismay. Do you remember working with him? Uh, no. I, I know the name, I know the man to look at, um, especially because I've been reminded of, on the occasions that he's reported here. And we've heard uh, evidence this morning that Donna Parker was, uh, to sorry, Donna Parker was David Miller's personal assistant. Correct. Do you recognise the other names, Mandy Talbot, Carol King or Tony Marsh? Yes, I recognise all the names. I, I don't know the people, obviously I know Marsh. Uh, I don't know Mandy's or I don't know Carol King, but I've seen a lot of their work in this inquiry. Uh, this is again talking about the uh, case of Cleveleys and M Mr Ismay sends on correspondence regarding the case including counsel's opinion. He goes on to say in summary we suspended Mrs Wilson home in 2001 after apparent discrepancies in her cash accounts. We claim for the value of these losses and she counterclaimed for loss of earnings. Within a claim was an expert's opinion which was unfavourable concerning Horizon and Fujitsu. Um, it goes on to say about lodging payments into court. We heard this morning evidence from David Miller uh, about him approving the settlement. Did you ever hear about the, that this case had settled? No, I didn't. Can you explain why uh, a settlement of this case wasn't discussed at the board or executive team level? Yes, Miller had delegated authority. Was this not, um, if you, the email here in Mr Miller's evidence was that this would have been dealt with by Peter Corbett usually? Correct. Um, and it went to Mr Miller in his absence? Correct. So is it your evidence that if either of them had any concerns, it was for them to raise at the board? Probably at risk committee, first of all, pre-board. Could we please turn to WITN 00210101? Before you go there... Oh, um, sorry, this, sir. Uh, Hang on, I was just checking what it was you were putting up. D don't worry. I was simply going to ask um, Mr. Mills whether he thinks that, regardless of whether um, either Mr. Corbett or <coughs> Mr. Miller had delegated authority to settle, the fact that there was an adverse expert's report about Horizon should have been taken to the risk committee. Yes, I think it should have been, Chairman. Right, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Stevens, carry on. No, sir, and, and on uh, 
we can actually look at that report now if I if I could bring that up it's WITN 00210101 this is uh, Mr Coyne's report uh, in the case of post office and Julie Wilson home could we please turn the page not going to read it all out but if we can go down uh, to the bottom half of the page please it refers to penultimate paragraph the majority of the system issues were screen locks freezers and blue screen errors which are clearly not a fault of mrs wilson holmes making but are most probably due to a faulty computer so due to faulty computer hardware software interfaces or power um, in fact, on a detailed view of call 11021413, um, dated 2nd November 2000, Ms. Tag may have witnessed firsthand the style of system problems that Mrs. Wilson Home experienced in her operation of the system. And if we could turn to page four, please. It says, in summary, from a computer system installation perspective, it is my opinion that the technology installed at the Cleveland sub post office was clearly defective in elements of its hardware, software, or interfaces. I understand your evidence to be that you've never seen this report before. Oh, well, sorry, I'll rephrase. Until the inquiry sent it to you, you've never seen it. No, I haven't seen this report at all. If this report had been put before the board or on the risk register, what would you have done? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, uh, because I've only seen three paragraphs of summary and one paragraph that you highlighted. So I'd need to read the whole thing in detail and with some time to assimilate it in my mind before deciding what I would have done with it. Mr Mills, this document was sent to you um, in advance of this hearing. Have you not had a chance to read it? I'm sorry, if it was... Uh, I would have read it, I can assure you of that. And I might well have forgotten the fact that I've read it. If, well, let, let me ask you this. Um, if you received, as a hypothetical, if you received a report from a joint expert that raised a concern that there was a reliability issue in Horizon, what would you have done? I would immediately have taken it down to Alan Barry and said, let's talk to me about this, please. So you, you would have gone to your IT director and taken his advice effectively? No, not necessarily taken his advice. This is occurring in Peter Corbett's area um, and uh, Miller knows something about it. So I would have started off with Barry. What would you have done then? Well, I don't know. It depends what Barry had said to me about it. I, I just don't know the answer to that. One element of this I want to explore, uh, and it's uh, we saw it earlier. There's um, Post Office Limited, or someone from Post Office Limited, giving instructions with legal advice coming from Royal Mail. Uh, in your witness statement, we don't need to have it on the screen, but it's page 15, paragraph 48. You say, with hindsight, the legal function should have re been reporting to me on matters related to Paul so that I could, sorry, matters related to Post Office Limited, so that I, I could exercise oversight of it. Um, when you say with hindsight, is this an area where you feel you, you would have been better served by having legal in-house or in Post Office Limited? Definitely. And why do you say that with hindsight? Well, because I'm now looking back at what's occurred during during the many years, even when I was there, let alone when I left, you can see that things were dropping through the slats. Um, and I'd have hoped that I'd have helped not let that happen. Um, to what extent do you think it was a failing for Post Office Limited not to have a legal 
uh, function on its board? I don't think it was a failing at all. Why? Well, I, perhaps I should remind you that I didn't retire from Royal Mail, I resigned. And I resigned on matters of importance. And what were those matters of importance? I disagreed with some of the policies that were going to be adopted by Royal Mail Group. Was one of those policies relating to where legal, the legal function sat? Whether no, or... it wasn't. So, going back to the, what we were discussing, the um, issue of whether it was a failing for Post Office Limited not to have a legal function on it, why do you say it wasn't a failing? Well, because you have to be in the moment. Uh, it's very easy to look back and say, well, it's obvious that you should have had a legal function. We did have a legal function. It was operated centrally by Royal Mail Group. Everyone had uh, uh, got used to the fact that uh, Royal Mail Group provided certain functions from its centre because it seemed to be more economical to have those functions uh, in, in, in a mass so that you could have the very best people all in together. Um, and, of course, they were in a different location as well. Um, uh, so, looking back, you, you can say to yourself, well, that looked all right at the time. But now I look back and I can say, no, it wasn't all right at the time. It would have been better if it had reported within Post Office Limited. Please, we bring up poll 3072892. This is a letter dated 6th of December 2004 from Lee Castleton. It's addressed to a Mr Knight, but if we can go to the bottom, please. We see that it's, it says copy to David Mills. Um, again, it won't highlight all the letter. Uh, it has been, it's a, in fact, it's exhibited to your statement. Um, in the second paragraph, as part of Mr. Castleton's uh, explanation of the problems he was facing um, with Horizon and his subsequent suspension and termination, uh, he says in the third line down, we explained we felt there must be something wrong with the computer system as we had looked through our paperwork repeatedly but could not find anything wrong. In the final um, paragraph, again refers to computer failure, third line down. All the paperwork that is required to prove the computer failure has been removed from this office for investigation. So now having no paperwork to prove my innocence, I do not know how to move forward. Were you aware of this letter? Yes. At the time? No, I don't think I was aware of it at the time. I am, I am now. How was correspondence such as this handled um, on your behalf in your office? Uh, I had a secretary uh, who would normally stamp it in, so I'd got a date stamp on what was received. And if it was obvious where it was going to lie, she would pass it out to whoever was going to deal with it. So if it was Corbett, if it was whoever. So could you, um, could you your voice trailed off at the end of it? I'm sorry. If it was obvious where it was going to be dealt with, she would pass it out to that entity before I received it. Would you have expected a letter like that to be raised, to be raised with you? Yes. But I take it from your evidence you can't recollect any dealings with Mr Castleton's case? No, I don't. Uh, Mr Castleton um, was involved in litigation with, brought by post office. Uh, were you aware of that litigation when you were in post? No. Please, could we bring up POL 
this is a draft note of a meeting titled Horizon Integrity on 6th of December 2005. We've referred to Keith Baines already and Mandy Talbot, who you said you, I think you said you recognise the name, but, but not necessarily what she did. Do you recognise anyone else in that list? No, no one. You'll see, um, if we go to one uh, and findings, it says there is no generally, generally understood process for identifying emerging cases in which the integrity of accounting information produced by Horizon may become an issue. And there's a discussion on, on potential processes. And oh, if we could turn to page three, please. Paragraph 14 refers to Mr. Castleton's case. The Castleton, brackets, Marine Drive branch case, scheduled for 7th of February, is the first of the current cases that may require expert testimony. This will not be needed on 7th February, but could be needed the next time this case is in court. Were you aware of an internal meeting like this to consider how Post Office Limited responded to Horizon Integrity cases? No. Why? Why should I be aware of it? Earlier in your evidence, you referred to having ultimate executive accountability for the operations of Post Office Limited, correct? Yes. And do you accept that how Post Office deals with um, challenges to the Horizon IT system is a significant part of its executive function or its operations? Yes. Do you accept that a, a policy such as that or a process as to how Post Office deals with those types of cases is something over which the board should have oversight? No. Why not? Uh, because I think it's the return of, well, why don't I understand and hear and know about this particular meeting? It's highly unlikely that I would know about every meeting of some junior managers all over the country. It's as simple as that. Well, let's rephrase the question then. Not this specific meeting. Were you aware that internally there was... A pro, uh, it was thought necessary to develop a process uh, to respond to challenges to Horizon. No, I wasn't. And I'd um, have been very interested in the fact that that existed because it would have meant we got problems with Horizon, which I wasn't aware of. And why do you, can you explain why, as Chief Executive, you weren't aware of that? Yes, I think I can. Um, despite efforts to understand and realise what was going, around, uh, going on with Horizon actually out in the field. Um, issues of the nature that you're discussing never came to the board. And in order to come to the board, it would have had to have gone through the directors or the executives. And none of those ever raised that issue with me at all. Mr Miller, we, went, we earlier saw a risk register which showed a challenge being made on the horizon reliability. Why wasn't that an alarm bell in itself? For the same reason as I answered to that question before, it was that I picked up the number a million and not horizon. Can we turn to look at prosecutions, please? Um, no need to turn it up, but for the record, it's page 19, paragraph 65A of your statement. Uh, you say that it was unusual for a company to be directly involved in criminal prosecutions. Do you agree with that? Definitely. What would your understanding of post officers' reasons for being involved in prosecutions? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Why did you um, believe, what, what did you believe was post officers' um, reasons for bringing prosecutions itself? Well, there would be multiple reasons, but broadly because someone had offended against the post office and what they did was, was supposed to be illegal. So in respect of uh, where the post office procure, procure, sorry, pursued a case for uh, theft, fraud or false accounting against a sub-postmaster, 
did you believe there was a deterrent effect uh, or, or it was a good deterrent uh, to stop future for alleged theft, fraud or false accounting? No, I don't think it was anything like that. I think that, we've, uh, that as with all of the whole of the United Kingdom, if someone has found nicking something, they try to prosecute them against, against it. I, I think it was as simple as that. I don't think there was any question about let's deter all these sub-postmasters. That's the last thing we wanted to do. We wanted to encourage them. I, I think you and Mr. Stevens may be across purposes. I think you accept that it was unusual, in fact, maybe in your experience, unique for a company themselves to initiate a prosecution. So I think Mr. Stevens is asking you... I'm sorry. ...why the post office was doing that as opposed, say, to involving the police. Thank you, sir. I, I, I stand... I, I now understand what the question is, and I'm very grateful to you pointing it out to me. Um, uh, I'd never worked for an institution that was capable of prosecuting somebody in the courts in their own right. Uh, it's not something that was in my purview. I would never have dreamt of it. I would always have thought that if we if it had been in the bank, our audit department may have found someone taking cash, we'd have taken them to the police, the police and said to the police, here's a chap who's nicking, they'd have taken it to Crown Prosecution Services, said that's okay, and they'd have ended up in court. And so I had no experience whatsoever of a company taking somebody to court in their own right. And and I was not aware that the post office could do that. When did you first become aware um, that the post office was involved with the prosecution of sub-postmasters? Probably as very late as November 2005. The very last knockings of my um, time there. Who told you? I, I don't know. Mr Mills, if, if this, as you, your evidence is that this was a very unusual matter. Yes. Would it not have come as a surprise to learn that the company you'd been chief executive of for several years was prosecuting people without you knowing? No, I knew they were prosecuting... Sorry. I knew they were taking people to court. I didn't know that they were doing it in their own right without some sort of external independent sign-off. Well, let's, let's take it in stages. Um, at an operational level, who did you think was carrying out investigations where sub-postmasters were taken to court for theft, fraud or false accounting? The investigations team in the network. Who did you think was responsible for deciding whether to prosecute? I actually thought that it was Royal Mail Group's legal department. Royal Mail Group legal department? Yes. And who did you think was responsible for conducting the prosecutions? For conducting the prosecution? I don't know who I thought was responsible for conducting those prosecutions. I don't know, I'm sorry. When were you f first aware that Post Office Limited had any involvement in the prosecution or, or investigation of offences? I, I don't think I was aware in the sense that you mean. I, I think that I entered Post Office Limited with, with the automatic thought that if somewhere had 17,500 branches and 65,000 staff, there would be an investigations department and a prosecuting department. I just would have thought that would have been natural uh, because you can't have that many people without criminality. I think it would probably help if we looked at some of the documents, actually. Um, could we please look at poll 00021483? So 
So this is a board meeting on the 20th of August 2003. And you are listed uh, in attendance, yes. as is Tony Marsh. Correct. Who was Tony Marsh? He was head of security, um, and I think head of security at Royal Mail Group, or reported to Royal Mail Group. In your evidence, you uh, say that Tony Marsh didn't report directly or indirectly to you. What do you mean by that? Exactly what I say. Sorry? Exactly what I said. He didn't report to me, and I don't think he reported indirectly to me either. I think he reported to group. We heard evidence this morning from Mr Miller, David Miller, sorry, that uh, he had regular meetings with Tony Marsh. Were you aware of that? Uh, I wasn't, uh, but I did know that Marsh reported on a dotted line to him. So if Mr Marsh reported on a dotted line to David Miller and David Miller reported to you, did he not report indirectly to you? Yes. So where are you say in your witness evidence that he, Tony Marsh didn't report directly or indirectly to you, that's incorrect? No, I don't think it is incorrect. I think there is a major difference between a dotted line reporting through a direct report compared to a hard line report through a direct report. And can you explain what that major difference is? Yes. Uh, it's called pay and rations. Um, if Mr Marsh reported somewhere else, the somewhere else could either sack him, could praise him, could give him more money, could give him a bonus, could tell him exactly what to do or not. In Miller's case, if he reported on a dotted line basis, in my view, Miller would have to persuade Marsh what to do. He couldn't tell him what to do. You were, were you aware that Mr Marsh, um, sorry, Tony Marsh, uh, was resp so responsible for head of security and also oversaw investigations? Yes. And you were aware, were you, that the investigations included investigations into sub postmasters? Of course. And you said earlier in your evidence that part of your duties as a director, you would consider your obligations to sub postmasters? Yes. Did you feel unable to exercise any oversight over Tony Marsh and the investigations that they were conducting into sub postmasters? No, in, I, I certainly didn't, because in practice, some of the oversight that one could uh, exert was purely a matter of personality. However, um, this is another case where there is, res there is clear responsibility into group, and it's another case where that confusion of reporting lines was an important aspect of how one did or didn't manage Post Office Limited. Did that formal reporting line actually prevent you or the board from overseeing what the investigations department were doing? No, I don't think it did in this case. Can we bring back up the previous document, please? Zero zero zero. Sorry, poll zero 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 two one four eight three. And if we could turn to uh, page eight, please. And to the bottom, please. Here it says, Tony Marsh presented the security paper to the board on behalf of David Miller. Can you recall why Mr Marsh presented it on behalf of David Miller? Uh, I, I don't recall, but I would guess that it was thought that Marsh would have had closer, hands-on knowledge of the issue that we were going to discuss. Was there any reason why at any other board meeting the board couldn't have called Tony Marsh to present and give a paper? No. 
I'm thinking now, but I'm not sure at all about this. I think that we started to have the idea that Marsh should report twice a year to us. But I'm sorry, I don't know that for a fact, because it was right towards the end of my tenure. What, what reason was there uh, not to, for, for Tony Marsh not to report directly to the board? There wasn't any reason for him not to report. Why, why, did, wasn't that, why didn't you uh, ask Tony Marsh to report to the board more often? I, two reasons, I think. I, I, I think corporate governance and the way in which the board operated was a growing thing that, remember, started from nothing and had to go to somewhere. Um, and so perhaps we just weren't on the subject fast enough. That could be one reason. Uh, uh, the other reason, perhaps, was a simple thing that this board was way down with things that it had to deal with, uh, uh, and it was very hard work. So putting more on the board agenda every time would have been difficult. Is that the case, that the board was focused on solvency and it wasn't focused on prosecutions of sub-postmasters? It certainly had more focus on solvency than it did on prosecutions, that's for sure. What focus did it have on prosecutions? Not a high level. Can you recall a time when the prosecution of sub-postmasters were discussed on the board? No. Why do you think that is? I think I've just given the reasons why. Do you think that's a failing of the board's part? No, I don't. Why? Because you, you, you have to put yourself in that time. Um, I, I can see why it should have done now, but it didn't then. Can we turn to poll two zeros one six six five six six, please? This is an email from Tony Marsh on the seventeenth of October two thousand and three to a large number of um, staff. It, if we go to the next page, please. The attachment is security team organization V4. Uh, dear colleague, as you will be aware from recent communications from both the chief executive, David Mills, and the personnel director, Ian Anderson, Post Office Limited must make further headcount reductions to support Royal Mail Group in its drive back to sustainable profitability. Were you and Post Office Limited responsible for the security department's headcount? Of course. Why did you then feel that there wasn't a more formal reporting line to you? don't think the two things are the same. I had the ability to instruct any executive to reduce their headcount without the question of reporting lines. So you had the ability to give, is your evidence, sorry, that you had the ability to give <coughs> Mr Marsh instructions to reduce headcount? Yes, it is. But he also, of course, could always overridden me and simply gone back to Royal Mail Group and said, he's asking me to do this. That's not fair, is it? Could we uh, go over the page, please? You see there's a discussion of a security... Uh, team lead and I examining a number of ways, sorry, a number of options, and came to the conclusion that the structure could be further streamlined in the following ways. And it refers to um, internal and external crime functions, etc. Were you involved in the detail of changes to the security department? No, non not at all. So I um, 
I'm looking at the time, I don't want. I, I am not. I'm not finished. Um, but I think we should take a, a five-minute break. Uh, I appreciate that might run us over slightly, but if if we could do that, I'd be grateful. Uh, right. Of uh, course. I'm okay. Sorry. I'm okay. You're okay. Yes. Okay. Um, if we may carry on for. Yes, uh, please. Yeah. In which case, sorry, I, sorry. I will. You. I will continue. Yeah. Please can we turn to poll three zeros two one four eight five. And could we turn to page thirteen, please? There's a entry under human resources here. Uh, do we take it to mean because it's human resources, this is referring to the Post Office Limited's workforce? Yes. And it states that the board agreed in situations where fraud had been perpetrated against the company. Now, pausing there, because this is in human resources, is that referring to fraud perpetrated by the workforce against the company? I'm sorry, I don't know. Reading the board minutes with your experience as acting as chief executive, what would your reading of them be? I think that it's saying we better get on more quickly in making recovery against those persons within the company that have tried to defraud us. So the workforce defrauding the company? Yes. And that would include some postmasters? Yes. And it says the appropriate civil orders will be used immediately. Was there a uh, sorry, and in advance of any criminal proceedings. Uh, is that referring to the use of freezing orders? I don't know, I'm sorry. You can't recall the conversation? No. Do you recall if the board there would have discussed the fact that Post Office Limited were advancing criminal proceedings? If they were in advance of criminal... No. We, we, would the board have discussed that Post Office Limited um, was advancing criminal proceedings? No, they wouldn't have done. Please can we turn to poll three zeros two one four eight six. board meeting on the 15th of uh, December 2004 at which you're in attendance could I ask you please oh, sorry could we turn please to page seven uh, oh, I'm, I'm totally sorry page six first please right at the bottom So it's referring to the Risk and Compliance Committee. Uh, Peter Corbett provided a short presentation uh, to highlight the work of the newly formed Risk and Compliance Committee. Do you recall the discussion on this? Very much so, yes. Yes, I was pleased that it was being formed. And from your recollection, what was the Risk and Compliance Committee there to oversee? Well... Initially, all aspects of risk and compliance that were identified as being uh, where we were, where we had a risk in the first place, and where there was any likelihood of us not being compliant with regulatory 
directives. Could, was this, as I understand it, this was the um, introduction of a, the, the only subcommittee of the Post Office Limited Board, is that right? Yes. So this was quite a significant step in Post Office Limited. Very important. It was it 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 was the step of of the board growing up into what it needed to be. If we turn the page, please, to see. It says the, the scope of its activity included audit, compliance, and legal issues. The primary aim was to ensure service and conformance elements of the business working together properly. First of Rod Ismay, Lynn Hobbs and Tony Marsh. And he says the next quarterly meeting would be held on 5th January 2005 to discuss branch control, vital few controls, audit reports, anti-money laundering measures, crime and fraud, and the work of the group audit committee. Was At this discussion, what was said about the Risk and Compliance Committee's role in respect of prosecutions made against sub postmasters? At, at this board meeting, nothing would have been said. This was a board meeting and, and announcing the formation of this committee having and uh, outlining broadly what it was going to do. That can come down, thank you. At the time, did you consider yourself the risks associated with um, Post Office Limited's involvement in prosecutions? No, I didn't. Why not? Uh, because I was too busy doing other things, but I should have done. What do you think those risks uh, were? If you were, with hindsight, what do you think the risks were? Of pursuing prosecutions? Yes. Being wrong. Do you think there were risks uh, associated with the disclosure of documents and Post Office Limited's failure to disclose documents? I'm, I'm sure that there were many, many risks associated with those prosecutions. Um, well, as we've now discovered, of course. Um, at, the, at the time, I personally didn't identify those risks, and I wish I had it done. Um, was not... there anyone else in the... Well, let's start with Post Office Limited, who you think should have identified those risks? Uh, I'm very surprised, in a sense, that the people dealing with the investigations, especially those people in group legal, had not come to terms with the idea that these things that were happening could harm us. What things that were happening? Well, the non-disclosure of certain facts to uh, litigants. Well, let, let's start on, your, on the Post Office Limited Board. Was there anyone else you think should have identified the risks arising from the investigation and prosecution of offences against the postmasters? I don't know. And, and I don't know because I'm trying to think at that time. In practice, who was overseeing the investigation and security department if it wasn't the board of Post Office Limited? I can't truly tell you. I think it moved around. Do you think that it's a failing of corporate governance that you can't tell uh, who was responsible for the investigation and security? Yes. Department. And who do you think is responsible for that failing? Of me, obviously. So I'm conscious of time. There are, I believe, some core participant questions. 
Um, Mr. Steen, is it anyone? Um, Mr. Maloney. Mr. Steen and Mr. Maloney. Right. Does that mean you're going to um, offer the floor to them, Mr. Stephen? Yes, I should, have, <laughs> I should have said I'm conscious of time and will offer the floor. Right. Then um, I'm sure that the 15 minutes which they normally afford themselves between them yes, I'm just... will be no more than about 15 minutes on this occasion. I'm looking for... I think Mr. Maloney says two minutes, two or three minutes. It's getting up. I, I can finish my question in two or three oh, minutes. Okay. Right. <coughs> let, 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 first of all, um, Mr. Mills, you happy to carry on for another ten minutes? Yes, Chair. Fine. So off we go then. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mills, you said your primary aim when you took over at post office was to, quote, keep this thing afloat, unquote. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. If you, if you couldn't turn the business around... Was there any danger that government would accept that the business could not be kept afloat in its then current form? It seemed as if there was. Yeah. Uh, there was no willingness on the part of government to give uh, ironclad guarantees mm. to creditors yeah. for us. And... In, was everybody in senior management and on the board aware of that potential? Definitely. Horizon was utterly integral to the operation of post office at this time, wasn't it? Crucial. Business critical might be another description for it as well. Definitely. And in reality, and, and I don't seek to in any way challenge that what you knew and didn't know and what you've said about that. Do you, do you understand me, Mr Mills? Yes. In reality at that time, having spent many, many millions of pounds on the Horizon system, if post office had been forced to go back to the drawing board on its online accounting system, the business was in real trouble, wasn't it? I'm sorry, I could The you business was in real trouble. Definitely. In, yeah. Crisis mode it would have been. In. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Mills. Mr Mills, I've got a, uh, just a, a couple of questions in relation to your knowledge at the time. You've uh, stressed to Mr Stevens in answers to his questions um, that you tried to work out what you knew at the time, OK? I'm going to take you to a document which is RLIT 40195. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Mills, you, you should be able to see that uh, we've got a photograph of you. Yes, dreadful. Is that correct? Yeah. We well, can see that this is a, an article that goes back some time. Um, in the copy I have, it, which I hope you'll take it from me, is uh, dated March 2005. This is uh, an article from the Sub Postmaster magazine. Okay. Yes, I, All rem right. I remember it well. Okay. So here what we've got is this. We see the heading, which is improvements to the post office horizon network. And you're saying at the beginning of the article, in August last year, I promised to respond to issues you raised about the reliability of the post office horizon banking services. All right, so that's what you're doing. Yes. Um, so putting this together, we can see at this time that you are um, trying to set out some reassurance to the branches regarding the operation of the Horizon system. Is that a fair description of what you're doing in this article? Yes, and, okay. I, was also, um, and I was also trying to prove accountability that what I said I'd do. Right. So can we then look at the third column going across? Yes. You see the one that starts in reality, and I'll read that out. In reality, Horizon provides a reliable service for the majority of our branches. Uh, most of the time, about 99.7 of the time, in fact. Having said that, I know that if your branch is affected by a loss of service, it is still significant, and since August we've been working with our suppliers to find ways of improving the overall level of service uh, while keeping our technology costs under control. Okay, you see that? Yes. All right. So, um, 
So you understood at this time, in March of 2005, that there had been issues raised concerning the reliability of the Horizon system. Is I that correct? I certainly did, right. yes. Were you aware at this time, in March 2005, that Horizon data was being used in, to support prosecutions of sub-postmasters? No, I was not. Right. Now, let's go a little bit further down on the second column. I don't want to miss out anything you find important. You'll see there are two bullet points that uh, refer to the faster resolution of BT faults. OK? Now, um, the first one refers to post office-owned telephone lines, and then it goes on to the second bullet point. I'll take my glasses off, because my copy is very small. I'm mm, it's better on the screen. It's bad, isn't it? Yeah. Working with our suppliers, we have identified a number of improvements in the way we manage network faults, which combined with the improved BT service level will result in, will result in faster problem resolution for the majority of problems. Um, we'll know how much faster when we finish reviewing and modifying our existing fault handling processes with our suppliers. All right. So March 2005, were you aware that there was a four-line um, system of support for faults within the Horizon system operated by Fujitsu? No, I wasn't. Okay. Now, how, therefore, when writing this article, um, oh, sorry, what were you referring to as regards the management of network faults that you refer to within this article? Um, an amazing number of the faults that sub-postmasters were recording were, first of all, because they had bad telephone lines that didn't stay up all the time and that hiccuped. And to get them fixed, you actually needed a man in a van and a shovel. And men in vans and shovels don't turn up just like that. You have to put your hand up and say to BT, would you please come? And in three days' time, hopefully, they turn up. So the getting our hands around BT's neck and trying to wring it was part of the problem. Also, the kit that was put into um, sub, sub, sub post, post offices, I'm sorry, uh, was not one piece of kit. It was a connection of pieces of kit. And pieces of kit don't always work. And the connections don't always work. And sub postmasters pull them out and they don't know where to put them back in. There was a whole variety of things that were nothing whatsoever to do with the software. These were real, practical, day-to-day -day hardware problems that we weren't getting to fast enough because we had 17,500 branches that were phoning up and we had to get round to. Um, so I was referring to a lot of that hardware solution and not actually software solutions because very often it was the hardware that was wrong. Right, so if we put this together, what we've got is you putting, uh, you setting out in an article uh, improvements that uh, are going to be considered for the Horizon Network. You're referring to difficulties with the, uh, the BT uh, line, yes? Yes. You're referring to uh, improvement with the BT service level in the second of the two bullet points. Yes. And you're also managing network faults and there you think you're referring to hardware problems? Potentially, yes. Yes. Now, um, at the time when this article is being written, um, where do you get the information from so that you can write this and actually give out this reassurance? Well, it was, it was just something that was so well known that, uh, that it, it wasn't something I had to go around and find out. Remember, I'm going around talking to sub-postmasters like very, very, very regularly. I mean, we, were, we, we talked to thousands of sub-postmasters in any one year on a regular basis. All of the executive team did that. We had regular, multiple meetings with sub-postmasters, so they just tell us. So your system of finding out the contents for this article for the sub-postmaster magazine is well, having a natter with a few people when you're wandering around doing your job. Is that about right? No, I certainly didn't say that. Well, that uh, seems to be what you're saying, so let's try and pin it down. No, it wasn't Did you speak to the IT team, Mr Mills? Did I speak to the yeah. IT team? The man who ran IT reported to me on a very regular basis. I reported, I had the, all of the executive team reporting to me at 9 o'clock every Monday morning. Um, we had regular conversations 
audit, w w uh, w in the diary with the National Federation of Sub Postmasters. We talk to the CWU regularly. These are not these are not things that tittle tattle that we were talking, dodging in and out about. These are major presentations and conversations with them. We right. put all of them together in a conference. Did you speak to the IT team so that you understood that what you were putting in an article, reassuring branches about the network system of Horizon, was correct? Did you speak to them? Did you get a report from them? Did you get advice from them in writing so that you can understand whether there were or were not faults within the Horizon system? No. I, on, a, on a normal basis of every corporate organisation, had regular and direct conversations with my IT director who had delegated authority to run the IT team. I see. Now, um, you've been asked a number of questions uh, by uh, Mr Stevens uh, in relation to the COIN report, and you've explained to the inquiry that uh, you don't remember... Uh, you're, you're either saying you haven't seen it or you're saying you don't remember having read it before giving evidence today. Is that right? Um, Which? Don't remember it or haven't seen it? Well, I don't remember it. All right. Um, but I, I'm sorry, but to be correct, all of the information that the inquiry has sent me, I've read. Okay. Now, you know enough about the COIN report to know that it, um, were, it merited a, um, uh, uh, a point in a risk register to say that there were some difficulties with the Horizon system. Correct. What you've generally said is, well, million pounds was a lot of money, and therefore that probably was the thing you put in your notebook. Yeah? Yes, I wasn't quite as flippant as that, but yes, that's what I'm saying. All right. Now, when you were getting the information you needed for this particular article in the Sub-Postmaster magazine to reassure branches about the Horizon system, did any of the regular IT um, chats that you had with your IT people tell you, well, hang on, we've also had this coin report that says that there are a number of things going wrong with the system. No. If I was going to put something out like this to the network, it would almost certainly have been copied to every director by the communications team for their comments. They would have come back, been incorporated by the communications team. I'd have re-looked at it and said, yep, that's OK, let it go. And had you been told by any of the people in the IT team within Poll? that one of the problems identified in the COIN report is that when someone phones the helpline, they get told to switch off the machine, and then that doesn't really help solve what solve software problems. Have you been told that at any stage, Mr Mills? Uh, no. If right. you mean had I been told that they were asked to reboot the machine, yes. Right. And were you told that by doing so, that can mask problems within the software of Horizon system? Definitely not. Right. OK. So, let's pull this all together. It doesn't seem from your evidence, Mr Mills, that you were told about the COIN report and the significance of it. Is that correct? Correct. When you come to write an article for the Sub-Postmaster magazine, it doesn't seem from your evidence that that therefore achieved a note in what you were then explaining to the Sub-Postmaster. Is that also correct? Correct. I see. Whose fault was that? Yours or other people within the poll? I don't think it was anybody's fault. You don't regard problems with the helpline, where people are being told to turn it off and then turn it back on again, causing software problems. You don't regard that as being an issue that perhaps you should have been aware of, Mr Mills? I said I was aware of the helpline asking sub-postmasters to reboot the machine. And did you Let's try and take that on, then. Did you perhaps say to anybody that uh, if these sub-postmasters are being told to reboot, does that cause any issues? Did you raise that as a query, Mr Mills? I raise many queries about Horizon on a daily basis. Um, <laughs> the, the fact that they were asking people to reboot something may, would, been a, would have been trivial in my daily life. Yet everyone was rebooting machines everywhere for every reason. They just used that as a, as a solution to a problem. So no, that wouldn't have caused great issues in my mind. Of much more importance was, how did we replace this system in five years' time? More important than the prosecution of small businesses, <coughs> more important than the people that are in branches going to prison, more important than people losing their livelihoods, Mr Mills? I didn't say that. You said that. Well, what do you say now? 
which is more important, what I've just said, which is people's lives being devastated and destroyed, or what you've said, which is, well, we had to keep an eye on the bottom line? Which was more important to you now, Mr Mills? Uh, first of all, I didn't say, well, we have to keep an eye on the bottom line. And secondly, obviously, the devastation to the lives of these poor postmasters was more important than anything else and should never, ever have happened. Right, thank you, Mr. Steen. Uh, just following on from that, really, Mr. Mills, I, I'm not for a minute going to suggest that um, rescuing uh, the Royal Mail Group and or the Post Office from insolvency was not critically important. I follow that, all right? But exercising the function of prosecuting people has various consequences and reduced to its simplest. It means that you take people to court and that in certain circumstances, very severe sanctions are imposed upon them. And it does seem to me, I have to say, that that is something which the board of directors of a major company should have very much towards the forefront of its mind, regardless of what other problems it faces. Is that fair? Yes. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, coming to give evidence after making a witness statement. I'm grateful for your participation in the inquiry. Thank you, and so we'll adjourn now until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Yes, sir. We have um, John Longman, who is a adjourned phase four witness, uh, and Alan Layton. And is Mr. Longman in person or remotely, uh, Mr. Stevens? Uh, I believe it's remote, sir. Yeah, that's um, what I thought. Yeah. All right, you. then, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning.